Uh, Mike, can you believe it? Our time is done. Sandy, what are we going to do? I'm not going to get to see everybody. I know. <laughs> Where did the time go? Oh, my gosh. I'm going to miss you guys. Doug, what do I do without Doug? And what do I do with Kelsey? And Stacy, all of you guys, I'm so happy to see you. Sonia, nice to see you. Everybody, Patty, my buddy Chanda, I'm so happy you guys are here. This is our review session about to go over everything we've covered. And I'm sure you'll be reminded of some things you forgot about along the way. And um, thanks to you guys being one of the first groups to work with me at the programs adapted. And um, now everyone's required to do their mind maps because it actually helps retain the information and they have to show it to get into class, their mind maps. And uh, it's a game changer. If you did mind map, I'm sure that you've retained a lot of information along the way. If you didn't mind map, I'm going to invite you to go back and look at those videos Chanda has sent you and uh, maybe consider mind mapping them. They're game changers. I like to say, you know, Tom Brady, the best base, uh, football player of all times, the GOAT, they call him, the greatest of all times. Uh, he still practices how to throw the football, how to how to play the game, right? You constant he's constantly being coached. It's not that you just learn a skill and you go, okay, I got it, I'm good. It's constantly practicing and doing it over. So hopefully that you'll be able to coach yourselves. I sent you guys my cell phone numbers. If there's anything along the way as you review content beyond this class today, if there's questions you want me to walk through with you, just send me a text and I'll find a show to hop on a call with you or FaceTime and I'll walk you through something and. Um, even start using just a, di a different technique a, a week. Maybe I'll talk to Chanda. We can send out little video reminders of a tip that you guys can get from me. But let's dive in because we have a lot to cover today to go over the review for the program. So happy you're here if you celebrate Easter. I hope you had a fabulous Easter. Um, I renovated my porch. I'm out here on my porch. I don't know if you can see. Um, I'm at home today. And my contractor was here this morning. So it's my Easter present for myself. Uh, and... Uh, you know, the power of that spring and that newness in the air. I chopped down a couple dead trees. They were gorgeous. One of them was gorgeous, still budding, but in the inside was hollow. And I'm gonna use that as a metaphor as our program today. What are some of the things that have not been working for us? It may seem on the surface that it's working, but really it's not making us as effective as we can be. So do you wanna be right or do you wanna be effective? We had a couple of big mottos. We went over this program. Do you wanna be right? Do you wanna be effective? Being, being respected, it comes first over, I mean, being trusted, trustworthy, is, comes over respect. We'll go over that today, uh, along with being interested. Instead of interesting, when we're interesting, we're going in that right brain space, our left brain space, when we're interesting, solve people's problems. So let's go in as we final, end this final class with your uh, mini groups. This is where you're going to go into that, that exercise where you're gonna be interested, not interesting. You're gonna ask people what's on your mind. Um, I don't know if it was from this group or another group, but I received an email two days ago from what, someone in my seven levels program, a man who said um, he has a very introverted teenage child and went to the teenage child and said, what's going on for you? And this child's very, very private. What's going on for you? And the, and the teenager who's incredibly private said nothing. And the dad said, huh, so nothing's going on for you. What else is going on for you? And used the system of just use it literally after the kid said nothing, then went in and asked, okay, so nothing's going on. Wow. Okay. Anything else going on for you? And the kid said, dad, actually, I've been wanting to talk to you about something. And they had a 20 minute mind blowing conversation. And he sent me an email over the weekend on Easter Sunday, um, which makes me emotional saying, thank you. I had an amazing conversation with this simple little tool that seems ridiculous uh, and then created an amazing opportunity. And if that can happen with pretty private teenagers, if you're not using it, then um, you may never know. So it's very simple what's on your mind whatever they say you repeat it and then say what else is on your mind and then you're going to stack it and then say is there something i can do to help um it's a game changer if you walk away with just this one tool and actually implement it not just you know i i see people take lots of notes which are great but are you transforming your notebook or transforming your life so i'm going to invite you to transform your life and uh, this is our final hurrah so have fun in your breakout groups uh, as more people join i see a couple other people coming in i'll pop them into some of your rooms if you them, please welcome them. The person who goes first is the person who your birthday is next. So whoever's birthday is next, share your birthday is whoever's next. Um, that'll be the person who speaks first. Someone interview them and take it from there. And I'll see you guys when you're done. When the first group comes back, I'll send an alert for other groups to start to wrap up. Keep in mind, some people 
We'll be in a team of three, so it may take a, a little bit longer. And um, then we're going to go through the levels. Welcome back. I'm so happy to see you guys. I hope you've had a great month. I can't believe a month has passed. I can't believe eight months has passed. <laughs> All right, here we go. Have fun. Hey, Kristen, it's Janine. I'm going to put you in a group. They're doing the exercise. What's on your mind? What's on, what's going on for you? So hold on. I'm going to put you in a room. Stand by. Say yes when you get the request. Did you get the request?
Oh, it's still here. It says I'm in the main thing. Yeah, you guys are the first people back. Oh, okay. We'll give people a little, a couple minutes. A lot of groups had three. Oh, okay. You got it. Hey team, I just uh, got let in. Um, where's everyone else? Hey, they're uh, they're in their little workout, their breakout room. Uh, uh, it's not just John, only us today. Everybody else had something else. <laughs> You're stuck with us. <laughs> okay, they're in breakouts. All right, <laughs> we'll be back in a second. All right, thank you.
Man, I like my view right now is the who's who of both powerful and beautiful people. I see Blair, Jacqueline, John, and Doug Cropsey. And what did I do to get such a perfect viewing? <clears throat> you must be talking oh, about Doug. Look at other people trying to pop stuff up now. Now other people trying to get into Forget the KP. KP is like, what about me? Come oh, on. I knew that if you make a noise, it's gonna I'll pop up on his That's screen. Great. So Let's all there talk. We go. Thank you. <clears throat> hey Blair, how good was the economist? He's you know, compared to other economists, he's really good. Is that Fratatoni? Yes, yes. He's the best. Yeah, a lot of times you discount, you know, there's some of their projections, they very rarely hold true relative to future forecasting of like applications and stuff. But his analysis of dynamic, right? And all that was very, very good. Yeah, I really like him. Yeah, I enjoy stealing his material for ops reviews. But he's definitely blue. What do you mean blue? <laughs> you, you remember blue? blue? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Yellow? Yellow. A bank analytical sounds pretty cool to me. Let me tell you, I do not want to hear from a yellow economist. <laughs> These are my interpretations of the economy that I think should be. Yeah, yeah that guy's interesting. I've been to dinner with him once. Michael Fratatoni, is I yes. yeah. 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 Hey, Monty, what yeah. are the chances he's on a call somewhere saying, Yeah, I was at a dinner that once with Monty? <laughs> I wouldn't say it was a pleasant experience, so. <laughs> it wasn't pleasant. <laughs> no, he was pretty nice. I just Where were the whole conversation was like uh, that was the wrong thing to say in front of us. <laughs> anyway, oh, really? Yeah. All right, I'm going to send an alert for everyone else to wrap up. Let's send that alert. Now I want to know, Monty. Maybe I won't. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, let me in on that conversation. Where did was you guys see him at recently? Where did you see him at, Blair? The peer group, the round table that we ah, did. Gotcha. Okay. What do you say, Monty? Did he rip on builder mortgage companies or something? Uh, we'll, we'll maybe talk about it when we're not being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> There's a paranoid guy right there. Yes, I'm anticipating. That's the wolf. The what? The wolf? The wolf anticipating. Think about the uh, consequences. Oh, you like that, huh? Yeah, I like it. That's good. Running scenarios. And obviously, I wasn't on there when you're talking about the view. No, you were not. <laughs> I, I have a good view, though. Look. Yeah, you do. You know where that's at? Okay. Taken uh, from your airplane, right? Clearwater Beach. No, that's the uh, Opal Sands, Clearwater Beach. It's a beautiful hotel. Oh, yeah, I love it. Do you, yeah, in Tampa, that's to me, is the most special place I've been. The Clearwater? If, uh, Clearwater, Opal, yeah. Opal, Opal Sands, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. we, had an, we had an event there. It was really, it was really nice. Yeah, we do mm -hmm. vacations there once in a while. It's like 15 minutes from it. That's pretty. Okay, we're down to 30 seconds. I just closed all the rooms. Okay, let me see if everybody's back. Not yet. All right, I think everybody's back. All right, welcome back. All Janine, right. Janine, can you make sure nobody else is waiting in the waiting room? Because somebody got Somebody left by accident. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they might be back because okay, someone good. I let somebody in. Okay, uh, good. Thank you. Let me just double check. Yeah, no one's waiting. But thanks for the shout out for that. Yeah, I saw someone was in there. All right, welcome back. All right, let's dive in. I'm gonna go over a little bit of the content and then I'm gonna um, I'll take some questions as we go along. And um, I'll probably add a little bit of extra content as we go along. So if you have your notes handy, you may want to grab it or at least have a blank piece of paper as we review um, some of the information. All right, here we go. Let me go back to sharing.
All right, the program seven, 11, uh, seven Levels of Reading and Influencing Human Behavior, Emotional Intelligence Made Easy. Emotional intelligence is that self-awareness, self-adaptation to be the best version of ourselves, and then um, paying attention to others, social awareness, and then are you good at motivating others to be the best version of themselves? Everything from decoding our own micro expressions to somebody else's to um, when we say detecting deception, it's not aha, I gotcha. It's aha, it seems like the person's not sharing everything with me. What kinds of questions can I ask to elicit more information from them so I can best serve them, whether it's our associates or, or the people that are buying our new homes uh, to Understanding the four interaction styles. We thought there were extroverts and introverts, but there's a, a four categories, extroverts and introverts. Um, then there's the versatile. I'm versatile in all three stages of decision-making and maybe you are too. Versatile means you have <clears throat> both that extroversion and the introversion, the privacy, uh, and the switch happens subconsciously. So we'll go over that. And then there's the neutrals, which about 10% of us have neutrality in our, in our interaction styles. And, and those people are read wrong. You're read wrong because people may think you're awkward or that you lack confidence. That's not the case. It's just, you don't have a strong need for sharing or a strong need for privacy. So when you go to in, uh, in, uh, in, inject yourself into a conversation, <clears throat> you, started, you can come across as awkward. It might come across as, um, oh, Stacy. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Were you having a private conversation? I'm sorry, was it private? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. And it comes across as for some people that you lack confidence. That's not the case. Uh, a friend of mine who's neutral, Bethany says, it's like a loaded gun and the bullet can't come out, right? Like you, you want to participate, but it's because it's not an inherent need so strong that it comes across as a little awkward. And then once neutral start to share, then they'll tend to repeat the same thing over and over because they <clears throat> struggle going back into privacy and pulling out. So we'll go into those four interaction styles and you could be something different in each of the stages of decision-making. So whether it was research, reasoning or the result. And then we ended with movement pattern analysis on a higher level with, <clears throat> I even showed you some of the movements on how we're motivated to make decisions. And I always say that, you know, I color my roots, I color my hair about every six weeks. I just did it a couple of days ago. Um, the roots come back in brown or brown and gray, um, but I've been coloring my hair blonde since I was 17. You think my hair would get with the program, right? And catch on, like, can you just start growing in blonde? Um, the more we try to change people, the more you'll, you'll fail yourself as a leader because every six weeks they're gonna go back to their authentic selves. So instead of getting people to change, the better technique to use if you are a leader within Lennar is to create strategies around people's weaknesses. And don't be shocked when their weaknesses pop back up. Someone yesterday from a, a different company, Equity Prime Mortgage, one of their leaders who had taken my program the first time, they're, they're doing a second group now. And so he's, he, he's taking it again, because anyone in the first group can, is <coughs> and he asked me a question about um, yesterday about someone who's uh, in his family, a couple of people in his family who just aren't his people and what he should do about it. You know, out of all the emotional intelligence training he learned over the last nine months, you know, what techniques could he use with these people? He still loves them. They're still his family. And I reminded him of the video that you watched with Brene Brown, if you were in that particular lesson, what if everyone was doing the best they could? How might you handle it differently? And then shared a story about sometimes people aren't your people. Once you realize someone is not your people, you can no longer be victimized by what you call their weaknesses. So one of my strengths is I am truth and I am open. I'm a work in progress. I know I'm the best version of me when I'm serving others and I'm constantly improving, constantly. I mean, if I had a, if nine months, I couldn't fill up the nine months with you nonstop with all my mistakes. So I'm a constant work in progress. So um, what if we're all a constant work in progress? And if you, I'm all about truth. If you're not about truth, you're a cheater and a liar. And for whatever reason, uh, you're just not my people. And you're my brother or my sister, I can no longer complain about you with that weakness because I can choose to keep you in my life. And so that was a really helpful tip. He said, he called me after the session and said, I needed to, to relearn that. Sometimes the people that are working with you, your associates simply are not your people. How can you still be a strong leader for them, even though their path is different than your path? The good news is when someone drives you crazy, 
Um, that means together you make better decisions. Stronger decisions are made when people make decisions differently, when we have different personalities, when you might be impulsive and want to seize the opportunity and get things done, done, done. And an employee of yours seems kind of gloom and doom. One of the associates is like, needs a snap. Well, what if this happens? And what if this happens? And what if this happens? And this and this and this. And they're constantly popping your balloon and you're like, less aiming, more shooting. Like get things done, less talking about it, like get it done and they can drive you nuts or the reverse can be happening. Together, the good news is you make smarter decisions. And um, so we'll explore and end our program with that. I did bring a case study with me on Legos. Um, I'm hoping we have time to get to it so we can put it all together with regard to decision-making. How did the Lego company take off? How can it help you at Lennar Mortgage um, be the best version of you as a leader there? So IQ versus EQ. So IQ is the know-how, EQ is the know you. You just did this exercise and I use this tool every single day, right? Reminding me, can I trust this person is more important than can I respect this person? But yet when we lead, we tend to lead with our expertise, right? I can solve that problem. We lead with, you can respect me. That's connected with competence. I'm just gonna ask you, that's great. Just to hang out in that right brain space, just for a hot second on asking people what's going on. What's going on for you? You may remember um, me asking you these questions early on in our training in level one, which was cognition. I'm gonna ask you these questions again. And if you happen to have your notes from this, this first session, I'm curious if your answers changed a little bit. You're gonna go into a small group and answer these questions um, in your small group, not the group you were in a second ago. So I want you to, uh, I'm gonna say them out loud, the nine. You can take a screenshot or grab your phone and take a picture so you can remember what the nine are. And I'm gonna ask you these questions and I want you to talk in your breakout room. How has this training helped you with something that was a really big challenge for you at the beginning of this course? Um, and if there's not an answer, if you're like, um, I, I don't know if any of it helped me, um, then I'm gonna invite you to say, uh, call yourself out. Did you implement what you learned here? I mean, it's great to learn new things, but it's all about the implementation that that changes the game for us. It's called the knowing and doing gap. So if you have not written this down, write down knowing and doing gap. Sometimes we know what to do. You've had the training and the expertise. You've had multiple training. I, I'm, some of the stuff, when I went to persuasion techniques, that was Robert Cialdini's persuasion techniques. I call it the little rascals. You may have heard of that a hundred times, but are you implementing it? Because other people are implementing it all the time. Or are you implementing it unconsciously and using it in a negative way, right? So when you're talking in your small groups, did you do your best at implementing the information you learned? Uh, if not, why not? And you'll chat with them and then we'll regroup and have some of you share if you'd like to. So here we go, take a picture of the nine questions. Let's see where you were versus where you are. Number one, are you usually aware of your feelings and why you feel the way you do? I'm curious if taking this training has helped you do a little bit of a pause and say, do I wanna be right or do I wanna be effective? If the answer is yes, if you have been able to in the last nine months, eight, nine months of us to being together, just pause and say, okay, they are different than me. Their roots are different than my roots. Um, how can I best serve them as a leader here? Um, so are you usually aware of your feelings and why you feel that way? Have you been able to take a pause and check in? Remember, anger is a secondary emotion to fear, anxiety, and sadness. So if you're angry, all of a sudden in those moments where you're angry, have you been able to take a pause and say, wow, I'm really just anxious. I'm really just sad. I'm really just disappointed. But wow, it comes out as anger quite a lot. That's interesting. It's something I want to check in with myself on. Um, so are you aware of your feelings and why you feel the way you do? Number two, are you aware of your limitations as well as your personal strengths as a leader? Um, what part of the program really frustrated you? How are you on sharing feedback? Uh, I asked to share positive feedback at the end of the program, you know, something that your biggest takeaway and something you were grateful for. Um, how did that work out for you? Is that a challenge for you? Is that easy for you to do? Did you also want to give negative feedback along the way? Um, so what is your, your limitations as a leader? I know for me with my profile, I'm very judgmental. I prejudge a situation and that's something I constantly work on. And so I like systems. So I like to say seven below, let it go, eight, nine, 10, get angry then or take action then. Um, so just numbering it is a great system because I'm always going to be a judgmental person. I'm a high evaluator. My strengths are that I create systems, but that means my weaknesses, I prejudge situations and I'm judgmental. 
this means if, if Chanda gets a haircut, I'm going to be like, you look gorgeous. I love your haircut. I'm going to judge positively as well. But when it's a negative thought, I, I take a pause now and I say, okay, how, seven below, let it go. How important is it that I say this negative thought right now? How important is it right now? My contractors just did a lot of work and there's a light over here to my left that's slightly crooked. When they just finish the work, they have to come back and paint my doors. So his whole team is here, this contractor, Alberto, who I love a lot, and his whole team is here. Am I going to say, hey, that's crooked right here, but yet they painted the porch. They did a million other things with perfection. Or am I going to pause? And so when I saw the light was slightly crooked, just tiny, but I could see it. I chose not to say it in front of all the workers on the day that it was done. I know they're coming back to paint. I took a pause and I just simply said seven below, let it go. It was how important was it for me? It was about a three, but old Janine would have just said it in front of everybody. And imagine how that would make them feel. I'm constantly trying to grow my own emotional intelligence. And this is why I'm so passionate about this product, this program. All right. So are you able to do that? Are you able to create some type of system, whether it's my seven below, let it go, eight, nine, 10, address it then. All right. Can you manage your distressing emotions? Well, recover quickly when you get upset or stressed. Are you, oh, did I miss two? Are you aware of your limitations as well as your personal strengths as a leader? Now go to four. Um, can you adapt smoothly to changing realities? Um, this is where we talked about um, the six basic human needs uh, adapted by Maslow. Uh, originally it was Maslow adapted by Tony Robbins. Um, if you are higher in uncertainty and variety, then you probably freaked out during COVID and all the changes, maybe even working harder, all these extra hours you may have had to work might've been a challenge for you, but someone who has a higher need for uncertainty and variety, the higher of that, they're going to thrive in this moment, right? They, they loved 2020. Um, so what about you? What is, what are you? Can you adapt smoothly to changing realities? How did that part of the program show up for you, those six basic human needs? And maybe even when you, in your group, how did you look at your, your associates differently or your family? Number five, how, do you keep your focus on your main goals and know what steps it takes to get there? I had sent this flyer to um, this questionnaire to Chanda. I don't know if you all had a chance to look at it, but these simple questions on decision-making, um, where to start. And as long as you cover all, I think there's like 22 to 24 questions. You can do it electronically or print it. If you answer every single question that covers all areas of decision-making, it'll help you focus on your main goals and know what steps to get there. The steps are right there. It walks you through and holds you by the hand. Um, I think I may have mentioned there's a billionaire that hired me to consult with his company in Chicago. When I gave him, I created that document for him and his company. He said, hands down the best tool, one and a half page tool, best tool he's ever gotten as a, as a CEO of a company. Um, and he gave it to everybody in the company. So look at those questions. If you haven't already used that tool, I'm gonna invite you to consider using that tool. Uh, can, number six, can you usually sense the feelings of the people you interact with and understand their way of seeing things? I would hope that this program, everyone from Frank Marsh to Dr. David Matsumoto, along with myself, I would hope that something you learned in this program helped you look at life from someone else's perspective. Number seven, do you have a knack for persuasion and using your influence effectively? Again, back to, do you wanna be right or do you wanna be effective? Have you become more effective as a leader? Uh, even a tiny little increase, you know, if I had a 1% chance of winning the lottery, I'd buy a ticket right? A 10% chance of 20%. So the 1% makes a huge difference. I always say if you're 1% better every day at the end of the year, that compounds and you're a completely different person. As a matter of fact, if you're leading the same way you led prior to the beginning of this program, that's emotional intelligence you may want to look at. You should be a different leader today than you were before game, starting this program. Um, all of us are. I am as well. So number seven, uh, number eight, can you guide a negotiation to a satisfactory agreement and help settle conflicts? All right, so this being a good listener, meeting people where they're at, hanging out in that right brain space. You may remember the cartoon where the purple guy loses his best friend. It's this little toy that goes into this pit, this abyss, and sadness comes over and happiness. And happiness is like, you'll be okay. You'll get another best friend. But sadness is like, wow, it must really stink to lose your best friend must be sad. I bet you had a lot of great days and times and memories with Riley and, and the characters like crying. I did. I did. Seconds later, he's able to do a reset himself. We talked about name it to tame it. 
right? So when we're feeling something or someone else is feeling some emotion, if you can name it, you can tame it. Because when, when we're emotional, we're not thinking with the neocortex of our brain. So when we name our emotion, and then I gave you in the workbook, um, name the emotion, then pick two other emotions to then take it to a deeper level. When you start doing that, your emotional intelligence begins to grow. Every day, if you wake up and just say how you feel, and then say two more words that go deeper on that one feeling, you'll begin to in increase your emotional intelligence big time. All right. And then number nine, um, do you work well on a team or prefer to work on your own? And when we talked about the interaction styles, um, there are private people. You may have privacy in one stage of your decision making, whether it's research, reasoning, or the result. And a lot of these open concepts, I don't know if you have them, but offices that have them, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have a quiet car room, right? Because the private people, the introverts really need some privacy to get focused. So these are the nine questions. Do you remember what yours, your biggest weakness was coming into the program? How, where is it now? And um, what led you to change the number or what led to not changing the number? I'm going to put you in a small group and then I'm going to invite some of you randomly to share your information if you're open to it. Enjoy talking to your room. Again, what's your biggest weakness when it, we started the program out of those nine? How has the program helped with that weakness? Or if is something else pop up? Wow, you know, this, I didn't even realize this was a weakness when I first took that questionnaire. And then as time went on, I'm like, this is a weakness. I don't know how other people are feeling or wow, I'm really aggressive on this one thing. I need to create that strategy for myself. I, I didn't implement the seven below, let it go, eight, nine, 10, but I, I think I would be valuable if I start to do that. Whatever techniques you've used, did you mind map? Was mind mapping helpful? If you didn't, do you wish that you did? All right, um, this exercise right here is uh, about five to 10 minutes. I'll check in with you when your group is all done sharing. Come back when I get the first couple of groups back, I'll send an alert to everybody else. Here we go. You know, if you ever get a massage, I don't know, or physical therapy, they always do this. They'll say, you know, you have shoulder pain, zero to 10, what's your shoulder pain? And you'll say, well, it's about a nine. And then after you get the massage or the physical therapy, they'll say, what's the pain now? And you say, it's a four. When you're able to say, here's where I was and here's where I am now, or, or decrease the pain or increase your knowledge and emotional intelligence, that's where we begin to gauge the impact of the program. So have fun. and just based on what they're doing you can actually see hey this you know this person's like they're not happy with you know obviously i'm asking for too much or uh trying to you know uh, whittle them down on a negotiation and it's and you can tell they're like out of they're not comfortable you know like
I am running to go get another beverage. I'll be right back. Hey, um, you guys are the first group back. So I'm gonna give them a minute. Some of the groups had five people, so stand by. No problem. David, were you only in a group with Chanda? Why are you back alone? <laughs> I scare them all off. Uh, <laughs> no, what did you do? No, it was Monty and Chanda. She oh, okay. Had, uh, she's refilling her beverage. Gotcha. How you been? Good. Um, I drove from North Florida to South Florida, got home at 2.30 in the morning. So, you know, I'm on three hours of sleep. I'm doing awesome. I think that's probably fairly normal for you, is my guess. Sometimes, at least once a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, actually, I'm handling it much better than I thought I would. I thought today would be way worse. Not so bad. Tomorrow, tomorrow's the day that'll get you. Yeah, you're probably right. Though you're still quite young. Uh, uh, Comparatively. I don't know. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know. Not, not quite young. <laughs> Remember my oldest child is 24. Yeah. It's hard when you're only 30 to have a 24 year old child there. Carrie. I'm awesome like that. <laughs> felt they needed a home I made a lot of adoptions yeah <laughs> yeah lovely. exactly it's just like how it worked out <laughs> I was like the older sister and whatnot and I had a yeah, toy so I just, like raise the kids <laughs> uh -huh. got a dad really young and so, yeah they're really not mine <laughs> I just took over the family don't don't dig any further it's a touchy subject <laughs> they don't know the kids don't know them just a sister oh if Janine, if you're on, can you let either, uh, can you let Monty back in? <laughs> they all text me when they can't get back in the meeting, apparently. <laughs> it's funny, it's all okay, I'm going to give everyone that. one minute more uh, alert. Stand by. Okay. There's a couple people stuck out there. Monty, I let Monty in. He's in. Yeah. Wrong button clicking. Yeah. Thanks. I've been scouring the interwebs looking at um, differences between allergies and COVID symptoms. I've done that before. Uh, uh. It's Florida. Everything is blossoming right now. Yeah. I'm feeling it. The body aches. That would be the big one. Yeah, I'm going with temperature. So I went through all those and I'm like, well, and I went and got a thermometer, said I'm normal. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna hang my hat on that. I'm in between. Uh, vaccines too so just oh be, yeah well that could be part of it yeah i don't think so uh no i just it would be to me it seemed a bit a little odd to catch it now but who knows yeah i think you can catch it in between though right is that oh you totally yeah you can no there's yeah. nothing to prevent it if you try hard enough <laughs> <laughs> true you don't have to try too hard in Florida. Yeah. I hope it's not. Awkward. I hope it's not. Dave is oh. fine right now. No, I'm fine. I told you, I'm, I'm going with temperature. Temperature's fine. Okay. Yet responsibly, I shall not interact with anyone until I'm certain. All right, everybody's back. Here we go. 
All right, who would like to share? Anyone want to share? Who's going to share? Are you going to make me randomly pick you? All right, Sandy, start it up. What's a takeaway that you had? And uh, where were you before and where are you now? <laughs> um, okay, so I think I shared in our group that, you know, I always thought I was a good listener. Um, but there's lots of things that, you know, I can implement and, and learn, especially one of the ones that I took away was the power of the pause. Um, I implemented it. I was telling them just the other day that, um, I was talking with somebody and, um, I could tell they were getting, you know, um, a little frustrated with our conversation and I just paused for a minute and I just let them, you know, get it out. I truly was listening and engaged in the conversation. And they, they actually even said, you know, um, I think you're on mute, you know, and I said, no, I was, I was listening, you know, so um, I, you know, I actually, you know, was able to implement, you know, one of the things that I learned. So that's, you know, great. That's so good. So out of those categories, what was your biggest weakness starting out? Do you remember? Um, probably this right now. <laughs> talking, I would say I'm probably more, I thought I was more of an introvert. I'm probably, I would say more of a neutral, um, but, you know, speaking in front of big groups. Um, so, you know, I was telling them that as well, that I've probably changed 1%. I don't know that I would say, you know, any higher than that, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So Good. this is, this has been a, a, a big one for me. Well, your share was beautiful. You did a great job just now. All right. I think it might be more than 1%. All right, Sandy, pick someone else to share, my dear. That was great. Um, let's see. Uh, Carrie, you're on my screen. <laughs> Hold on. Am I on mute? Not on mute. Um, so the one thing that stood out the most to me, and it was probably more personal than, than professional, I think I'm a little bit more aware of it on the professional work level, was taking my attention and focusing it on the conversation or giving the time. There was a story, Janine, you told about the kids and being on vacation and you're like, we were just on a two week vacation. How could you say this or whatever? Oh, sorry, but you didn't actually have time with them or something. So it's like when, when I'm done working that I actually stop, put it away and focus on whatever it is that giving them my full attention to whatever the topic is. I feel like I do a good job of that in meetings because that's the topic of the meeting, but as soon as I'm off the computer, right? It's like not too many other things going around on around. So yeah, that was the story about Six Flags. And then the kids said on the way home, I'm bored. Right. And I did an event and a couple of therapists that work for jails said to me, bored is code for I don't feel seen. I don't right. feel like I matter. And it was a game changer for me. And it's it's I'm glad you brought it up to me to remind me of that lesson. It's I think sometimes we have to be reminded of lessons over and over and over again. Yeah, like, so just talking about it today reminded me about it because I, I literally just did it all week. Like I did a terrible job at it all week. So it's just trying to have that awareness of it. Yeah. That's great. Awesome, Terry. Pick who goes next. I'm going to go with somebody who's not on my screen. Let's go with Doug Calabrese. You, you meant Cropsy, right? No. <laughs> uh, Doug. So uh, fantastic. Uh, so we, we started off with, uh, or we acknowledge that uh, my biggest thing is not trying to always find solutions and just listening. Uh, I've gotten probably worse at it uh, working from home. Um, and uh, yeah, but at least I can acknowledge it. Good. That's emotional intelligence. Good. What was your biggest weakness coming into it out of that list of nine? Uh, I mean, again, definitely uh, not not just listen, not just listening, uh, uh, but trying to find answers while listening. So that was it, right? Coming in, and it's, uh, it's so I mean, yeah. I mean, that that I mean, we could probably just rank those uh, as my weaknesses, but I put that as number one. Okay, okay, good. Pick who goes next. Thanks, Doug. Uh, we're here with Monty. Monty. Hello. Oh, uh, let's see. Can you all help me? Here? Yeah. Yeah, we hear you, buddy. You can't hear me. Okay, <laughs> I can't hear anything. Uh, okay. Uh, my uh, let's see. The most I've learned is like from you know from the beginning to start, like looking at people's body language more, looking at their eye movement, things that I was you know I had always heard about that people do, 
and you can learn things about whether they're angry or especially when you're negotiating or something like that. It's really important if you get them on video. Uh, I just kind of, you know, I think it's important also not, you know, to if you can do it in person, do it in person. I think it's it's more uh, obvious that somebody's doing something or the way they're looking or their eye movement, their body language, that kind of thing. Uh, so I've tried to, you know, kind of implement that in things that I'm doing just to be more aware of it. So I think I've improved there. Uh, so, well, because I really wasn't doing it before. And then uh, secondly, well, not to the extent that uh, we've learned in this, in this group. Uh, secondly, the biggest weakness, uh, I think it would be like just tailoring conversation or meetings or things like that to the appropriate audience. So sometimes, you know, we were just talking about, you know, sometimes it's 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 better to say less than more in, in certain audiences or, or vice versa. I do I I find you know after you went over it, I do it really well when you're when in writing. I think you know like sending emails or things like that, but not the same when you're in a meeting with somebody. What to say? So that's okay, it. good, good. We're all works in progress. That's great, Monty. Pick one more person to share, and then we'll go back into the review. Um, let's see, Sonia. Sonia. You said Sonia? I was like, don't say oh, yeah. Sonia. I was like, don't say Sonia. Don't say Sonia. You said Sonia. I called it to myself, right? Um, well, I was, I really like the, the body language because I deal a lot with, you know, different types of people. Um, so that, that just kind of solidified it for me. Uh, a lot of things that I had learned and pieces of it. So that helped me a lot. And I think mapping has also helped me a lot in my, um, in doing my investigations, I used to do a lot of notes kind of thing. Now I just do like a map and it just kind of, it kind of helps me see the, the whole picture um, as I'm doing investigations. I, I really like it. And, and I'm not writing like 20 hundred pages that later on I have to decipher again. Um, so that has been a good tool for me. Um, you know, and I was, when I was talking to my group, it's just, it's a lot of, Info, so I really like this review session because a lot of things are coming back. <laughs> uh, so I think we've learned a lot, but it's kind of hard, like you say, to implement it uh, in our day to day. Um, so I definitely have enjoyed it. And I have, I'm sure I have a long list. I just have to kind of go through it and see all the things I have implemented. I'm just I'm not conscious about it. I'm doing it subconsciously. Um, all right, so Tanya. I, I love it. That's the perfect segue going back into the review. So good job. It was like we planned it. Thank you. All right, let's go. Let's go back in. All right. Uh, you may remember early on, I talked about this guy that reached out to me, Jesse Itzler, and he had he had emailed me on my email and then on Instagram and then I think on LinkedIn. Hey Janine, I can turn your training into multi-million dollar training. I want to offer it to my people. I have an opportunity for you. Opportunity for me is typically in the speaking world means I want you to speak for free, but you could get business from it from my clients. So I don't like the word opportunity as a, as a keynote speaker. It tends to have a negative connotation to me. Um, so it wasn't until he said, Janine, I just watched your TED talk, how five words can change your life. I loved it. I'd love to set up a time to talk with you. He climbed down the mountain. What Dr. Christian Conte said, and I mentioned his name before, is that when people get out of jail, they say, you know, do less of this and more of this and you won't end up in jail. That's like climbing up the mountain and screaming down, Sonia, come on up, it's easy. Versus climbing up the mountain, coming back down the mountain, meeting Sonia where she is and saying, come with me, I know the way. So are you meeting people where they are at? You know, oftentimes we're not taking a little bit of a pause to just think where might this person be coming from? What might be going on with this person's life right now? Uh, a friend of mine just visited from New York City this past week, and she wrote to someone from high school, and did, she didn't write back for two weeks. She was, can you believe it? She didn't write back for two weeks, blah, blah, blah. That's this and this and this, and started being pretty judgmental about it. And I said, well, you, you know, maybe call her. You don't know what's going on. And, and so at Easter, my friend wrote, happy Easter. The woman wrote back and said, oh, my gosh, Terry, I'm so sorry I didn't get back to you. Um, blah, blah, blah. His husband died. He had a heart attack the day before Easter. And before that, she was diagnosed with colon cancer. And so the last couple of weeks that she didn't get back to Terry, she had all this like very heavy stuff happening. And um, it's just a great reminder for me, again, when someone's not getting back is what if everyone's doing the best they can? 
So right here, meeting people where they're at, taking a pause, just saying, you know, can I meet them where they're at? If they're doing the best they can, can I take this less personally that they're not responding to me? So this guy, Jesse Itzler, then says, well, I saw your talk, which fills up my significance bucket. And then I get in touch with him uh, and write back. And then he writes to me. And you may remember, he not only wrote to me on Instagram, that's where I did the video, three people won't call me back. I forget who I said. I know I said Dr. Fauci. I think the Dalai Lama, number one, Dalai Lama, number two, Dr. Fauci, number three, you, Jesse Itzler. And did this funny video. And lo and behold, he wrote back 53 minutes later. 50, and then I ended up speaking for his company and I'm getting a radio show in his radio network. So um, just pausing. He had not gotten back to me in a couple months. And I was ready to like, let's send him a nasty email. And I stopped and said, Janine, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? You may remember that body language comes before thought. And early on, I showed you this tree um, as our visual. So the first step, there's four steps of communication. The first step are the roots of the tree. Um, this is our belief system. This is what we believe. This is our life's purpose. Then comes body language. Then comes thought, then words. And if you think of the words like a fruit or a nut on the tree, my I have a peach tree in my front yard and two apple trees, but the Apple trees are not blossoming yet, but the peach tree is, the little blossoms, right? So when the nut or the fruit falls to the ground, it creates a new tree. So words are important and intention is important. The body language and thought follow suit. So we've got to pay attention to our words and our intention. The why. Simon Sinek, who talks about why, you know, good companies know what they do and how they do it. Amazing companies know why they do it. My why is to inspire you to look at your world in a different way. If when we hang up today and say our goodbyes for now, uh, if you were inspired to look at your world in a different way, then I've checked the box for my life's purpose. So I can show up and be excited to be here because I get to share this information I've learned from many mentors through my life. So intention comes first, then my body language happens. I'm not saying I'm gonna do an elbow pop, then a chin grab. It just will automatically happen if I'm confident and, and, and connected to my intention. To prove it, I can show you, and you may remember this video. I'm not sure if I played it for you or not, but if I did, I'm gonna play it again. It's about 10 seconds long. And this is where Jen Aniston reads a mean tweet and she's gonna leak sadness. And when she leaks the sadness, it's, it's the dumbest tweet. You're like a bag of flour that got its big break. It's so stupid, but immediately leaks sadness with the corners of her mouth and you'll see the dimpling of her chin. I'll slow it down for you. This is sadness. And um, when I see this in someone's face really quickly like this, it's intriguing to me because you know how they feel before they know how they feel. Remember, because what happens is body language can show up up to five seconds before thoughts, because body language on the tree happens before thought. So intention, body language, thought. So we know how someone feels before they know how they feel. Are you paying attention? Let's watch Jen Aniston. I think a couple minutes later, she's like, this is the dumbest thing ever. I think she probably gets over this pretty quickly, but this dumb insult hurts her feelings. Jennifer Aniston is what happens when a bag of flour gets its big break. Because it's like I'm a bag of flour. <laughs> All right, did you see it? Watch the sadness come in, right? So when it gets the big break, watch here. So we see that dimpling in the chin. Even if I play it at fast speed, which I'll do in a second, immediately, if you don't catch it, you feel it. You're like, oh, that hurt her feelings. This, this sadness right here. Look at this. And... Then what does she do at the very end? She touches her face with the index finger. Anytime we touch our face, so please take this note down if you don't remember this. Anytime we touch our face, it does a cognitive and an emotional reset. So even in comedy shows, when you watch people doing comedy, you'll see the people in the audience touching their face ah, <laughs> when they're laughing. Why? Because there's a spike in thinking, a spike in cognition or spike in emotions. And so when we touch our face, it sends these nice hormones through our body to do a reset. Um, when people are stressed or anxious, um, especially powerful people, they'll tend to touch their face with an index finger. You may have remembered a story I told about a guy who uh, was a vice president over at NBC, Comcast, NBC Universal. Um, his name's Lee Strauss. And we went to breakfast and he closed the deal for uh, The Voice and America's Got Talent and America Teenage, no, America Ninja Warrior. He was, he's since left NBC, but he's so high up. And we went to breakfast after he saw me in an event and I realized I'm talking nonstop. 
Do you want to be interested, Janine, or interesting? So when he did this, it, to me, it was an alarm to say, Janine, stop. Stop being interesting. Stop talking and be interested. So I stopped my story right there. And I said, Lee, enough about me. What's going on with you, buddy? And a couple of days later, he flew out from LA into DC and stayed in my office for, I think, almost a week and wrote a book proposal for a book on negotiation he's doing. And now we're friends forever. We're forever friends. We talk all the time. I love Lee Stress. But it was just me noticing it. That's emotional intelligence. If you're seeing things you didn't see before, congratulations, you've had a boost in your emotional intelligence. Just Remember the power of a reset. And you can find this online if you wanna see my video, but I was doing a, a live seminar for politicians in upstate New York, somewhere over there. It was like New York or New Jersey. I think it was upstate New York. And um, this guy in the back was very difficult. His name was Mark. I didn't know him at first. And we're talking about shoulder shrugs. He started being very combative. And he said, when did shoulder shrugs change its meaning? It really means blank. I go, well, shoulder shrug means uncertainty. Right. And he said, no, shoulder shrug really means you're not interested. And I'm like, maybe the person's interested, but they are just uncertain of when they can do it. Um, it means uncertainty. And so I started getting defensive and I list my bio. I'm like, I've been trained by Dr. Paul Ekman, who a TV show was made about him in a movie. And he's on the same list as Freud as the hundred psychologists to ever influence the world. I don't know who trained you. Hello, my significance and ego being challenged. And here I take this Everyone in the audience looked like they were on the Hulk roller coaster of at Universal Studios and they, the bar just went down and they realized they don't like loop roller coasters. And so I did a reset right there. I taught for another maybe five, 10 minutes. Because when I said to Mark, we have to agree to disagree, he goes, there's nothing to agree to disagree about. You're wrong, I'm right. And the whole audience just looked so uncomfortable. And I, I taught two more techniques and realized I lost everybody. And so I did a reset live. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube if you want to see it and then fast forward it. It's probably in the middle somewhere or you know, probably 30 minutes in. And uh, I did a reset and I said, uh, you know what? I want to reset this room because I feel like all of you look like a roller, you're on a roller coaster you don't want to be on. Mark, let's you and I go back to this. Now everyone probably thinks Mark and I hate each other, right? Because we just butted heads. But I have a funny feeling Mark and I have a lot in common. See, high determining people they uh, persist against difficult odds. When the going gets tough, we get tougher. However, our biggest weakness is we get stubborn at expense of everybody else in the room. And I think, Mark, you're probably my people. We just are coming at it from two different perspectives, but we've made everyone else uncomfortable in the room. So I'm gonna come and either shake your hand or give you a hug. So are you on the hug program, Mark? Or are you on the handshake program? Because we're gonna do a reset. You and I are about to become friends, my friend. And so we reset the room and the, all these politicians, they couldn't believe what had just happened because all this strife happens all the time in politics. And for some reason they can't do this reset. And so someone from, I wanna say Duke University was in the audience and she thought I staged the whole thing. She couldn't believe it. And I said, no, the, it's just self-awareness that um, I wasn't perfect. Next time I'll have more self-awareness to not have to justify where I got all my training. And then the next time, I'll be able to do something different. So constantly getting better because my approach was not great. I would say I gave a C minus performance. I did the reset, but the 20 minutes before the reset was a train wreck. Can you reset? On your VIP portal pages, if you didn't go there, I sent them a reminder today with some links that you can click very simply with the box. If you did not go, I get that you're busy. You really cheated yourself because I put my favorite videos. This guy, Dr. Christian Conte is the guy that said, climb down the mountain and take people with you, meet them where you're at. I put a video for you for both of them. This is Dr. Lisa Genova. Um, she talks about different things like Alzheimer's, but also talks about um, you know accomplishing things that you think you can't accomplish. And Dr. Christian Conte talks about dealing with anger. And I put their TED Talks along with some other supplemental information for you on that VIP portal on, a, a, I wanna say it's level one with cognition, it is. So check that tab out. You can go so deep down the rabbit hole with emotional intelligence, there's so much to it. So self-awareness, emotional self-awareness, self-assessment, we just did another self-assessment when we begin the program today, self-confidence, social awareness, empathy, you know, what if everyone is doing the, the best they could, organizational awareness, service orientation, self-management, can you control yourself? I love hearing that, you know, some of you use the power of the pause, adaptability, achievement drive, initiative, Relationship management. Are you able to develop others, influence, and change catalysts? Teamwork and collaboration. Good evening. 
Uh, I don't know if I played this video for you. Uh, I'm going to play for you. I have a funny feeling I didn't play it. Um, but this is the Prime Minister of Australia, and his name's Tony Abbott. And Tony Abbott went out to a battlefield and said to the fellow soldiers um, of a fallen soldier named McKinney. McKinney was shot and killed, had a little daughter and a wife, shot and killed in front of his fellow soldiers. And now the leader of the country goes out to McKinney's fellow soldiers and says, on live TV, I guess shit happens. What? The power of body language, your body language, your emotional intelligence is being judged by others. If you've seen this video with me before, it's worth watching again as a reminder. Here we go. Good evening. First tonight, a developing story out of Canberra. Tony Abbott has been caught out seemingly insulting a Queensland soldier killed in Afghanistan. Footage shows Mr. Abbott being briefed about the battle which killed Lance Corporal Jared McKinney. After being told about the complications of the firefight, this is Mr. Abbott's reaction. <laughs> Mr. Abbott was then lost for words when confronted about his comments. Look, a soldier has died uh, and you shouldn't be trying to turn this into a subsequent media circus. The soldiers should I shouldn't. Yeah. But I'm not turning into a media circus. I'm showing you vision of you, your reaction to his explanation about what happened on the day in the operation in which uh, McKinney was killed. How's that turning into a media circus? Okay, well, tell me, what's the context? And if it's out of context, what is the context? You're not saying anything, Tony. Um, I've given you the response you deserve. He nods his head 34 times and says nothing. So everyone look at me. Let's nod your head 34 times. Ready? Set as fast as you can. Ready, set, go. I'm at 15 and I'm no longer happy. So your body language and how you handle these difficult moments is being judged by your associates. It's being judged by people who are watching you. How are you handling those difficult times? In this moment, when I saw Tony Abbott, I felt bad for him. That's fight or flight happening for him. I immediately thought he lacks emotional intelligence because because remember Michael Phelps, we talked about Michael Phelps. So Michael Phelps, that knowing and doing gap. So he knows what to do. And then are you doing it? If you're not doing it, then you're in here in this valley of the knowing and doing gap. And what happens in the valley is emotional intelligence because you can have all the skills in the world, but if you're not implementing them, it's because your emotional intelligence isn't kicking in, isn't kicking in. Uh, did I, did, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, I brought it just in case. Um, this guy, Brad, uh, do you remember this? Did I show you guys this? Does this look familiar? Yes. All right. What's the recap? What do you, what do you remember? I see Patty shaking her head. What do you remember about this guy in this video? What was your takeaway? Do you remember? Yes. He's trying to convince a woman to go into some program. And then it was like kind of a pricing thing. We normally don't do this type guy. Yeah. Good. Good job. Normally. Good job. And does she buy the system? How do we know if she bought it or not? Do you remember? Face. The face, right? When we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. Good job. So by the way, if you send us referrals and you have an opportunity there, we put you on our Christmas list instantly. <laughs> instantly. So how do we earn your business? How do we get you to say yes? It seems like it's just a lot of upfront. Normal pricing is 25000 set up, design, one time. So when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. Please write down the expression, the term, what do I do? What do we do to get you to say yes? So this is what's called an embedded command, right? So embedded commands get the message in there. So the embedded command is to say yes. If you don't already use this with people, you can use this with your kids, with significant others. You can use this with anybody. Um, what can we do to get you to say yes? Think of saying things in the positive way. Our subconscious has no sense of humor. So you want to say it in a way that's positive. So positive, what can we do to get you to say yes? It sets up a system. Then we just operate on a rev share. We ask for a thousand dollar minimum because if you don't think you can make a thousand a month, you probably shouldn't do it. The good news about us is with the, the rev share, which is really where we make our money. If 
if you don't make money, we don't make money. So we're here to help you make that money. Let me ask you a question. If you don't make money, this is the rev share is where we make money. If you don't make money, we don't make money. We're here to help you make money. I want to point out, by the way, I know Brad's not everybody's cup of tea, the man who's talking here, Bradley. I want you to, I want to point out though, he's saying the same thing three times. This is a valuable persuasion technique. So whatever it is that your lesson is, um, by the way, this isn't just in sales. I remember when I worked for ATF at the World Trade Center in New York City, and I went to a special, I was the public information officer for a while, PIO. So I did public relations and I remember being interviewed on the Today Show, I think it was like 26 years old. Um, Ginseng, you may remember Ginseng came out in the mid nineties there, it was big, it was probably came out before then, but it was the hype in the early nineties to mid nineties. Ginseng was like 85% alcohol and all these um, young kids, like elementary school kids, the parents were stopping at these five and dime stores buying their kids ginseng. And they're having these little shots of alcohol, not knowing, thinking it's liquid vitamins. And ATF gets involved because it's 85 plus percent, it's alcohol, it's almost all alcohol. You have to be 21 or older to get it or they'd have to reformulate their formulas. So I was on the Today Show talking about this. I remember putting together my press release and, and, and putting together my notes the way that ATF trained me. And I learned my degrees in communications and public relations from college. And one of the things you do is you find out your key message and you constantly repeat it. So for me, it's to inspire you to look at your world in a different way. You hear me repeat certain things every single class. Do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Um, the, the higher the hold, more anxiety is told. Or when we steeple people, we intimidate people. Or um, you know, be, being more um, being respected is more important. I mean, being trustworthy is more important than being respected. So it's constantly repeating your message. What is your message? What is your why? If you don't know what your why is, I'm going to invite you to take it a next, you know, the next step. Look at Simon Sinek material, maybe figure out your why, repeat it constantly. I, I repeat my why all the time, my life's purpose. If it were free, would you do it right now? Of course. <laughs> you, so, so, you, so somewhere between free and whatever it costs, there's a deal there. So will we go over how we're gonna set this up before I sign or no, you have to sign first and then go over it. To Lips again get a group of people in here to start work usually at the sign that part of consult usually so we've got that ly word i call them the wiggle words so when we don't like what we see or hear our lips disappear you think you're out o-u-t out ordinarily usually typically ordinarily um any of these ly words some of the ly words uh they're wiggle words it doesn't mean it's definite I asked that Brad if, if he was thinking of bringing someone in to give her ideas. He said, yeah, I was on the fence. He had someone working that day. I did this in a, a, a TED talk, uh, how five words will get you what you want. I just wanna point out how weird it is, right? 100% natural grass fed, uh, grass finished organic meat versus typically 100% natural grass fed and grass finished organic meat. If you saw it, first of all, it's probably illegal to see this in a grocery store, but if you saw it, you'd probably pick A over B. But yet when people use the word typically or normally or ordinarily, we tend to not pick up on it. Uh, and from now on, I want you to start picking up on these wiggle words. Is there another way? Maybe there's not, but maybe there is. This is your foot in the door, right? It's They're trying to shut the door, but your foot is still there if you can pay attention to it. Chris Angel, the power of these embedded commands, saying what he wants Oprah to do, he's influencing her. Remember, write this down if you didn't already, your subconscious has no sense of humor. That means when you say things, you send messages to people, they pick up on it. So if you say, oh, my back is killing me, cancel, cancel, um, your body is saying, okay, your, your RAS, your reticulating system is saying, okay, let me find a way to make that happen for you. So I always say, you heard me say it a second ago, cancel, cancel. So when something negative comes out of my mouth, I cancel, cancel it. I do a manifestation prayer every single day, every single day, all positivity. I receive new offers from unexpected people and unexpected places in my life. If you want my manifestation prayer, um, just write a note and I'll read our comment section in the next breakout room and, and uh, put your email on there and I'll email it to you. Or even better is your cell phone because I can, I can text it in your cell. Um, the manifestation prayer I read every day. All right, so Chris Angel uses these embedded commands to get what? Oprah to say, uh, to, 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 give, to give him uh, an alert, a sign what number it is. He asked her to write one to 100. She writes the number 11, but at first it looks like 77. So she does it again. He is able to guess it. 
And what I do here is I slow it down and show Oprah, and we'll get into micro expressions next, which is level two emotions, level two, part two, we'll do part one first. So right here is the eyebrows go up, right? In that micro expression and she does You're a shrug, shoulder shrug, uncertainty. Here we go, hold on. Listen to his embedded commands. Here, and I'm going to show you how I use psychology and how I study your mannerisms to get inside your head, Oprah, and tell you what you're thinking. You're going to tell me what I'm thinking. I'm going to try. Right now. Right now. Okay. I need this pad. You need a pad. Right over here. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to write down a number. I'm going to turn my back. Okay. Um, I want you to make sure I'm going to come over there. You actually make sure I don't look. There's no way I can know this. Okay. I'm going to ask you to write down a number between one and a hundred. Any okay. number at all. Okay. Write it really large. Show the audience because they're going to help too. But don't tell me what the number is and don't you scream out the number, okay? I'm going to go don't right over here and you make sure I don't look. I'm I don't any sort of thing. So you cover my eyes and like this. Okay? Okay. Write it really large over. Show the audience and let me know when you've done that and then place it face down on your chest. Or should I sit? You don't know what that is? Okay, hold on again. Okay. Okay, everybody got it, right? Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn around now. Okay, fair? Yeah. Okay. Everything fair? Everything's okay, what I'm going to try to do is to look at your pattern and how you and your mannerisms. Are yes. you playing a little poker? Not much. No. See that? I'm already, it's already working. Okay. But I want you to do is think of the number. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Uh -huh. Don't give me any visible indication. You could try to throw me if you want, but don't give. We don't hear the word don't. So whatever comes after don't goes to the subconscious. Pay attention to your don'ts. Any indication. I'm just going to ask you some questions and look at you. Your number is between one. And 50, 51, and 100. Now, interesting, I don't know if you saw this over here, but when I said 51 and 100, you blinked. Did you see that? She's trying to throw me. So I'm going to go with 1 and 50. I wasn't trying to. Hey, no, that's okay. Subconsciously. So I wasn't trying to throw it. I wasn't trying to do anything. Okay, good. I'm trying to figure out. I'm going for you. I hope you get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One in 10, 11 in 20, 21 in 30. 31 and 40, 41 and 50. Okay, I'm gonna go with just by the blinking pattern, I'm gonna go with 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, Okay, let's try this again here. This is interesting. Okay, okay this is interesting. This is interesting because this is not a trick. This is me just really stuttering you. And don't give me any indication. I'm done. Between not. one in ten, I'm going to eliminate one in ten right now. Eleven and twenty. Twenty-one and thirty. Thirty-one and forty. Forty-one and fifty. So eleven between eleven and twenty is what I'm going to go with. Eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I'm going to go with this because you are by far the number one personality on television. So it has to be, and I'm number one at what I do, yeah. so it has to be 11. <laughs> so remember the power of don't pay attention to your don'ts do you write them 
and whatever comes after the don't is an embedded command. It's, it's twice as powerful, it goes to your subconscious level. Now let's go into emotions. So we already talked about just Jesse, Jesse here, Jesse Itzler. He, that emotional intelligence, uh, uh, me ready to, old Janine definitely would have fired off a nasty email when he didn't get back to me for two months, but I took a little bit of a pause and said, okay, how can I climb down the mountain, meet him where he is? And him and his wife, Sarah Blakely, uh, who invented Spanx, they're big on Instagram. So I met over there on Instagram. Then with emotions, after we did emotional intelligence, we, and what it is, we brought in um, Dr. David Matsumoto. We talked about different emotions. There's seven that we all have in common, happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, contempt, and disgust. And so we see happiness, it's kind of an obvious one. We see sadness, so the ha happiness, the, the eyes wrinkle like this, the corners of the mouth go up. Authentic sadness, the inner eyebrows pull together and up. You'll see this dimpling in the forehead like this. Um, this is surprise versus fear. And surprise, the eyebrows go up in a curve, and fear, they go up and are straight across. And as you might imagine, um, they make a big difference if, if you're seeing surprise versus fear. Um, you tell someone a number, or you tell them that the date is the closed date for their new home has postponed or something has happened. There's been type of a hitch. Even in a Zoom meeting, you can see very quickly the three whites of their eyes, white, 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 sometimes four whites of their eyes, these inner eyebrows will go up and, and straight across. And the mouth is taut. Although the mouth is open in both surprise and fear, the mouth is more relaxed and oval and surprised and the eyebrows go up in a curve. In fear, the mouth is more pulled back and taut. By the way, surprise is the quickest of all emotions. It's a catalyst for other emotions. So if someone comes at you with a problem, with a, with, with a, a dangerous situation, they may go from surprise to fear. Surprise itself is never longer than two to three seconds max. Um, so if someone is acting surprised for a long time, then it's likely they're, they're fake. I'm not going to go into Britney Spears right here, uh, but here you may remember Elizabeth Holmes. So Elizabeth Holmes was the CEO of this amazing company called Theranos. And um, it was all, I think she had good intentions probably in the beginning, but it was all, she was, she bamboozled so many multi-billionaires and millionaires. So she does a couple things here. Uh, I want you to pay attention. You may remember this sound effect that she makes. See if uh, any of you remember that name of the sound effect that she makes and watch what happens with her face when asked this particular question. I don't have many secrets. Um... So the question, tell me your biggest secret. Tell me your biggest secret. I'm gonna play it for you again. Tell me what that sound effect is if you remember the name. What's the sound effect? What do you, what's the name? Does anyone remember? It's called tut tutting. So I want you to write it down. Tut, T-U-T hyphen tutting. Um, this is when you're sitting at the dining room table and, and a holiday and you say something inappropriate and your grandmother or your Nana goes like this, Carrie Rogers, Carrie Rogers, right? Uh, you're wearing a hat at the table, Sonia. As adults, we tut tut when we feel under stress or pressure or we messed up on something. So when you hear someone tut tut, by the way, we all do them. You probably tut tut numerous times throughout the day. And it's probably at a time where you're forgetting something. You're like, and, and you'll notice now, you can't unnotice, you can't unhear you do it or other people, this tut tutting. But it indicates there's a problem here. I remember doing a celebrity lie detector live one night on Anthony Weiner. And while I'm introducing, I was talking about Anthony Weiner. You may remember him with the whole, they called it Weiner Gate. He text message pictures of himself in his underwear to underage women and ended up in going to jail for this. And uh, I, I'm ready to talk about tut tutting. And I tut tutted introducing the video. I went, uh, this clip, and I go, oh my gosh, I just did the thing I'm going to talk to you about. The reason I did it and I called myself out, which is emotional intelligence, is I said, the reason I just did it, it's under stress, anxiety, or we made a mistake, there's a problem. 
is I wanted to Google if he's already out of jail and if he's out of jail, what's his probational terms? How long was he in jail? Like I wanted to get some fun facts about what actually landed him in jail and is he now out? But by the time Celebrity Lie Detector Live came, my ADD had kicked in and I forgot to do it. So while I'm doing my presentation, I wreck my brain's like, oh, you never found out about the, but no one knew other than me, but my brain did. So notice those tut tuts when you do them yourself, it's a great an alarm system for you to say, wow, what is it that, what is it that I'm subconsciously concerned about right now? Where's the problem here? And take a second, reflect on it. And that's going to continue to boost your emotional intelligence. At the end, then we see her, right? This dramatic pause. So let's see. So the, the question's asked here. She doesn't answer until right here. So she answers at six seconds, 43. So six seconds, 43. And then she, when she does answer, look at this dimpling of her chin and this deep swallow. Watch, nice smooth face right here. See your chin? Now watch this. This is going to be sadness coming in. Why would you be sad if you don't have any secrets? That's kind of a good thing, right? Here we go. Look at this. Sadness. So this becomes what in my world we call a hot spot, right? She's telling me something good. She doesn't have secrets. Although she doesn't say I, doesn't, I don't have secrets. What does she really say? I don't have many secrets. Uh Great. I don't have many. Frank Marsh, who we brought in, he would tell you, pay attention to the words. You know, everything means something. So I don't have many secrets. Great. I don't need many. Just tell me one. Oh, that was a, a freeze frame of her doing it. You'll notice that, by the way, you'll notice that even on the phone. When we go into these seven emotions, anger and contempt and disgust, I call them the troublemakers, right? I think they call them the something horsemen. Um, in the psychology world. So I call them the troublemakers, anger, contempt, and disgust. Anger, the brows come down, the forehead is furrowed, the lips get really tight or the lips disappear altogether. Contempt is moral superiority. So it belongs there if we give Chanda a big award and we say, round of applause for Chanda doing such a great job throughout this program. And Chanda may lead contempt because that's moral superiority. It's excessive pride. It's when we do something great. The problem is when someone's not doing something great or you're confronting them on a potential problem and they leak contempt. A-Rod taking steroids and being asked by Katie Couric if he was taking them leaks contempt. It's an inappropriate spot to have this moral superiority. And then discuss this wrinkling of the nose. You may remember David Matsumoto told us anger is the easier one to overcome out of these three troublemakers because anger is really what? What do you guys remember? Do you remember what anger is? What's anger? A secondary emotion. It's a secondary emotion of fear, anxiety, and sadness. I shared that, but what did Dr. David Matsumoto talk about with anger? Do you remember? It's like an unmet need or goal. Not unmet. Well, yeah, kind of, it is, but it's, it's blocked. So there's okay. a need or a goal that's being blocked, okay? So mm -hmm. close. So it's not like I wake up and I haven't lost my weight. It's, it's uh, yeah. I'm trying to lose weight. Someone is, something's getting in the way of me getting what I want. And so the reason um, anger is easy to overcome, which many people don't think that to be the case, is um, you just realize, oh, okay, it, it's it's goal. Someone has a goal that's un, that's being blocked. So all I need to do is figure out what their goal is, and maybe I can help them unblock it. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to take it personally when someone's screaming and yelling. You don't have to be like, don't yell at me. This, you know, I'm a hothead. I'm a, I'm a recovering hothead, and. I did a big program on anger for a client uh, a month ago and did a ton of research on anger. And um, it's fascinating, the world of anger, right? And I have a contractor that was doing a lot of work throughout my house in the last couple of months. And they left this big giant vacuum. It probably weighs 70, 80 pounds in my bathroom. They were painting my bathroom. And I sent a picture of it, okay? And it's right outside my shower. And I go, hey, you left this big vacuum here. Sent a picture to the contractor. Just left five minutes earlier. He goes, oh, we'll pick it up tomorrow. I go, okay. I have a webinar that night, ironically, on anger. The webinar is at like eight o'clock East Coast time. It's a nighttime webinar for people who pay to, to do it on their own. It's a class uh, called Camp Power. It's for women. And I'm 
I'm talking to the woman who, who's running the program and she's telling me different people are going to be on there. And she came to the meeting late and I'm, I want to get all these notes about how I can best help people. And she's telling me who has anger issues and what their issues are. And I'm taking all these notes. And um, I said to her, I go, listen, I got to run to the bathroom before this webinar starts. She's a friend of mine. I go, I got to run to the bathroom really quick because the webinar is about to start. I was on the call an hour beforehand, but then we ended up talking for this whole hour. So I run in the, my, my, I'm already on Zoom. And so I run to the bathroom, but when I jump over, I jump over that vacuum thing in my bathroom. What do you think happened? What do you think happened to me in a bathroom? What might be on the floor in the bathroom? Water, you fell. Yeah, my two youngest kids, Charlie and Jack, had just been taking a bath. And when they took a bath, they didn't bring the towels in from the from the um, hamper, I mean, from the um, linen closet. So they got out of the bathtub, I didn't know, soaking wet. So when I jumped over the vacuum, I landed on wetness and I slid and fell flat on my butt. What do you think happened next? Yeah, I peed my pants. No, I peed my pants. I fell, the impact, and now I peed my pants. So now there's this big thump. My au pair comes up from the basement. Is everything okay? What was that noise? I'm like, no, not every, no. I'm on a webinar in two seconds. I just peed my pants. Now I got to take a shot. Or this is, so old Janine before emotional intelligence would have gotten mad at who? Who do you think I would have gotten mad at? Who would I have blamed? Your kids. I would have blamed the kids, right? That they didn't clean up after themselves. They didn't get a towel. Who else might I have blamed? The contractor. The contractor. I would have been texting him immediately. I just fell because that big 80 pound thing, you want me to lift that 80 pound thing out of my bathroom? I couldn't get in the shower. I jumped, I fell. Now I hurt myself. I've got to get on this webinar. Now I got to take a shower. This is unacceptable. You need to pick up your tools before you leave. Unacceptable. But new Janine, that's constantly a work in progress. Maybe <laughs> like you. I said, okay, seven below, let it go. Eight, nine, 10, get pissed off then. So I was like, this in perspective is probably a three. Janine, when I just pause and name it, when you name it, you tame it. I get back with the neocortex, rational thinking. So I go, Janine, what could you have done differently to avoid this? I could have went to the bathroom before I got on the call with the woman. When I first got on the call an hour before the webinar, I could have said, Tammy, let me run to the restroom really quick before we start our, our talk um, for prior to the class. I could have did what? I could have moved the vacuum right? I couldn't move the vacuum. So all I did was take that little bit of a pause, name it to tame it, take, you know, it was like, a, I don't even know, it was definitely under a seven. And then I said, what could I, you know, what could I have done differently to have a different outcome? And it's a game changer for me because it's not, if you're angry all the time, it, the research on this is terrible, by the way, you're more likely to get, to get, have a heart attack, more likely to get cancer. The numbers are through the roof, like 86% increase in your risk of getting cancer if you're an impulsive hothead. So you may need to, to work on that. So paying attention, anger, right? There's a goal and the goal's not being met. Contempt is moral superiority and disgust is, we know what disgust is. I'm just not happy with it. And then I pulled these different characters um, representing each of these emotions. You may remember Michael Phelps, this big meme went along, meme uh, where he like made this disgust face. Anger, like. And uh, Jimmy Fallon had it on his show and highlighted it. I want to do this video reminder of a little bit more about anger. I think going into 2021, um, you know, people are divided on this vaccination shots. You know, some people have them, some people don't. I have one of my clients for a live event. Her and two people on my team, her team rather, have asked me now between the three people four times if I have my vaccination yet. And in the state of Virginia, I don't qualify yet. I'm not an elderly person. I don't have high risk. I don't take care of someone with a, a child with a, a disability, a severe disability. And I don't qualify yet. So I don't have the shot. Will I have it before your class uh, on July, whatever? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I don't control the laws here in Virginia. I don't know. Right? So this anger, I got to tell you, it's wicked irritating to me that I've had numerous people ask me. The country is divided. I'll get the shot. When... I'm el eligible to get the shot. So let's watch a little bit more about anger. Anger, like fire, can be good at times, but it can also destroy the longer we hold on to it, ravaging relationships and lives. Why do we have it? And why is this grip so powerful? 
Hi, I'm Peter Montoya from Thrive Union, and I'll be sharing our current thinking on anger as part of our How the Brain Works series. Anger developed to help us react quickly to protect ourselves. It arises primarily from an ancient portion of our brain called the amygdala, which triggers automatic responses when we're threatened, commonly known as fight, flight, or freeze. When distinguishing a threat, the amygdala activates the hypothalamus, which tells our pituitary glands to release the hormones like the stress chemical cortisol, adrenaline, and norepinephrine. Before we're even aware, our body is flooded with hormones and neurotransmitters that shoot up our heart rate, energize our muscles, and increase blood pressure, all to get us ready to fight. Systems like digestion and vision are limited, along with our prefrontal cortex, which controls reasoning. Our hippocampus quiets, reducing short-term memory and new memory formation. All of this makes us impulsive decision makers who may say harsh words we don't remember after the fact. These reactions helped our ancestors survive wild animal attacks, but the long-term effects ravage our modern bodies. Too much anger compromises our brains, increase high blood pressure, heart disease, and compromise immune systems. Worse, the amygdala has trouble distinguishing modern slights from imaginary threats. So how do we manage our anger? Brain scans of murder show damaged or less active prefrontal cortexes showing that one key way to combat anger is to strengthen that area. But can you grow gray matter? Yes. Research shows that meditation has been shown to both shrink the amygdala and grow the prefrontal cortex. Research also shows that venting or suppressing anger actually builds it. Instead, mindfully observe your feelings or try reframing them. Imagine learning that the driver who cut you off just lost their child your anger would likely immediately turn into compassion. Our imagination can trigger the amygdala or quiet it. Try creating stories that reframe an offender's actions when there is no real threat. And don't forget meditation. Meditation is by far and away the best practice for reducing all recurring negative emotions. Changing how we approach our anger literally changes our brains. It frees us from the tyranny of automatic responses and helps us enjoy greater health, longevity, and fulfillment so we can thrive. Thrive Union is a real world community. Okay. Uh, let me get my video back on. Let's get ready to take a couple notes here from David Matsumoto. Okay. So you may remember that the elementary basis of hatred is anger, contempt, and disgust cycling. So anger, contempt, disgust, anger, contempt, disgust, anger. If this is happening, this is the elementary basis of hatred. So if you're wondering, what is hatred when you hate someone? In order for you to really hate someone, those three emotions have to be involved. You have to think that they're, they're beneath you. You're better than them. Even if it's your value systems, it's better than their value system. You have to be angry. And then you have to be disgusted with who they are. That's where anger comes in. That's where hatred comes in, rather. Emotions are mental glue for our thoughts. Emotions keep our thoughts together. So I'm sharing this with you as leaders at Lennar Mortgage, because if you can take a pause when someone has an emotion and you just take a pause and, and realize, okay, this emotion they're feeling, it is, it's their mental glue for their thoughts. So now it's giving you some information about what they're thinking about maybe in that moment. And here's the rub. When you're angry or you're sad, or even better, if you're happy, it's easy to dredge up other times you felt that same way. So if you're happy, it's easier to remember other times when you felt happy. If you're angry, it's, it's easier to remember other times that you were angry. It creates a catalyst to bring on those moments, okay? And it's important to know that um, every emotion has a, a time course where rational thinking can come back in. Every emotion, happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, contempt, disgust. It, it does have a time limit, a time course where rational thinking can come back. But here's the deal. Everyone's point is different. So you KP might be able to get over things really quickly, right? You're mad. Someone made you angry. You're disappointed and you're livid for like 15 seconds or 20 seconds. You're like, Hey, want to go get a beer? And you get over it really quickly. But Renee, her, her anger or her disappointment or her contempt may be longer. So the problem is we think our way is the best way. Your way is just your way. Remember, no one gets mad at the giraffe for having a long neck, right? Everybody's different. 
So are you getting mad at the giraffes having long necks? Everyone's time on emotions, that, that time is different when rational thinking can come back, but it will come back. It just, everybody's a little bit different. It doesn't matter how you intrude rationally. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're in an irrational process, Okay, so wait, let me say this differently. So it doesn't matter if you are being rational with somebody, if they're in an irrational emotion. One of the ways to know that they're in an irrational emotion, sometimes will be obvious, but sometimes um, they'll repeat the same thing. It's like a record, if you remember records for the 50 year olds like me, um, it's like a record when it would skip, right? So you, you can't come at it with a rational, they're just not there. They're not thinking with the neocortex. They're not thinking of the neocortex. So you need to find out what your point is. What's your point of going back to rational thinking? And are you happy with how long it takes? So for me, falling over that, when I jumped over that vacuum thing, uh, and then, I mean, it was a disaster. And then I'm on this webinar. It was an absolute disaster. I was so immediately with so much anger. And because I've been working on my reaction time and slowing it down, I had a completely different response. As a matter of fact, when my au pair ran up, I was laughing hysterically by the time she got there. I'm like, unbelievable. This is hysterical. I could have did a million other things to avoid this happening. I knew my kids were going to take baths. I could have put the towels out for them, right? There's a million. They could have taken baths downstairs in her bathroom. There are a million other solutions I could have done. So find out what your point is and then prove upon it. All right, um, a lip roll. I, I say when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. Dr. David Matsumoto calls this, and if you're doing a mind map, it's really easy to add this bullet right to that. It's, he calls it emotional control. So when someone's lips disappear, they're trying to the, control their emotions. So people will put up imaginary walls that aren't there, imaginary walls. If there's an emotion and a value that's attached to it that they don't want you to know about. So they'll do these emotional walls. You feel it. You can feel when you're with somebody and they have that emotional wall. Uh, emotional wall. I want you to write down emotions connect to values. So someone's emotion, it's, it's linked to people's values. It's linked to people's values. And then last but not least, I wanna talk about some of the psychological triggers Dr. Matsumoto talked about. So anger, we already talked about, which is goal obstruction. So anger is goal obstruction. The mind is processing how an obstruction is blocking me from what I want. Frustration is a part of the anger family. Frustration is low level anger. So if you're very frustrated, it's low level anger, which means what? There's a goal that's probably being obstructed for you. So when someone's angry, you can say, oh, that person's mind is perceiving a goal and that person's mind is experiencing an obstruction to that goal and we can take it not as personally. All right, the psychological trigger for fear, it's a threat to self. Fear is a threat to self. It can be physical or mental or psychological. Contempt, the psychological trigger for contempt, I've already mentioned this one as well, is moral superiority. Someone or something is below me. The last couple. Contempt, con uh, I mean, disgust. Disgust is contaminated objects. Disgust helps us repel contaminated objects or contaminated thoughts, con contamination. Sadness, the psychological trigger for sadness, loss of something that is important. Loss of something that is important. So this is important. So if you're in a meeting and someone leaks sadness, oh, now I'm doing contempt. You tell them something and they leak sadness, you now know, huh, they just showed me sadness. They have a loss of something that's important. The word important is critical here. So say you have a delay in the home being built, right? And they're not going to pass the papers in time or whatever. You're adding a garage or the, the addition. They, they want a different countertop than what they originally asked for, whatever it is. And it's, it's 
it's being the builders holding it up or it, it's not you and but they're calling you because they like you and you're their point of contact it's not you're not whole you know it's not even a mortgage related thing maybe but they're calling you because they like you and could, you've done such a great job building rapport understand that that sadness is not only a loss of something but it's a loss of something that's important a great way to build rapport is just simply saying it seems like this is important to you and then meet them where they're at remember don't solve the solution so quickly what else is going on for you right? Slow it down, stack it up. All right. Next is surprise. Surprise is novel information, novel orientation. It's new information someone didn't know. That's the psychological trigger to surprise. So if we know anger is goal obstruction, what do you think happiness would be? Goal what? Achieved. Achievement. Yeah, goal attainment. Good job. Is that you, Mary? Good job. So happiness is goal attainment. Tony Robbins says it's not actually goal attainment. It's goal progress. It's progress. And you you may want to not call people out in the moment on how they're feeling. Instead, and, and instead, you may want to do it in private and say, you know, tell me more about that or what are you thinking and do that in private. If you see fear or sadness on someone's face or you hear it even over the phone, I want you to slow down, drop your tone just a little bit, have some empathy or at least perceived empathy of their thoughts and feelings. Get them to loosen up and they'll become more flexible about what they're talking about. If you see contempt, they're thinking something or someone is beneath them. Contempt is an inactive emotion. All other emotions prepare us to do something, but contempt is making a statement that someone or something beneath me is occurring. In these moments with contemptuous people, their challenge, you want to be humble. Could you help me out with that? So they think they know it all. They think they know it all. So you want to, you want to be humble and, and turn to them for guidance, stroke their ego, their, fill their bucket of significance. You know, is this something that you can help me out on? I have this problem because contemptuous people are jumping at the bit to tell you what to do. You know, you go away being the stupid one and let them have the upper hand. Any questions on what we just talked about before we go to the next level? Anybody? All right, I'm going to send you into a, a breakout room just for five minutes. Everything that we just reviewed, what is the thing that you needed to hear? You're like, wow, I really needed to be reminded of this one. So go say hi to your groups and we'll see you guys in five minutes. We did level one, which is cognition, which is um, the body and brain talking to one another. We talked about that questionnaire we did up front. We talked about understanding a little bit about emotional intelligence. And then we went into um, phase two, which uh, is emotion level two. Uh, with regard to emotions and um, the seven universal emotions and the catalyst for them. We'll see you in five minutes. You're going to be in a new room. Here we go. See you in five minutes. What's the big thing? You're like, I needed to rehear that one.
All right, you guys are first. Let me do a little alert. Make the face there. Make the <laughs> okay. Welcome back. All right. Here we go. Hopefully, you had a chance to chat with people about uh, something that you needed to be reminded of. Now, let's look back at these emotions. So this is discussed. We've already gone over this. This is what it looks like. The wrinkle, the nose sometimes wrinkles like we see here and the upper lip can come up right here. This is a micro expression of disgust. Uh, this is exercise, watching gross, disgusting things, videotaping yourself, doing your own disgust. We won't be doing that. And then these are the different emotions. Um, this one's contempt. The only unilateral expression on one side of our face is contempt, that moral superiority. It looks like a smirk. Did you or did you not indicate that you loved your mother? I'm not asking you if you love your mother. I'm asking you if you indicated it. Uh, we're not going to play this. This is Jody Arias, but during this interview, I don't know if you remember her, she was charged with murder, but um, she leaks contempt numerous times throughout the interview. We're not going to play it because it's uh, a little bit on the longer side. So this contempt, this moral superiority. When we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear or, or suppressing emotions. This anger, also anger here with the nostrils blowing out. Here's some, and that was a splash of contempt. Here's contempt with Jesse Smollett. You have to understand also that it's Chicago in winter. People can wear ski masks and nobody's gonna question that. You have to understand also that it's Chicago in winter. People can wear ski masks and nobody's gonna question that. Right there, the Roger Clemens wife, <clears throat> Linda Clemens, uh, when Roger was lying up on the stand, in, uh, in um, Congress, um, leaking contempt when he said, no, Andy Pennant misremembered my conversation with him. I wasn't taking steroids. My wife, Linda, was because she was going to be the cover of a bodybuilding magazine. For the record, have you ever used steroids, human growth hormone, or any other performance enhancing substance? No. Have you ever been tempted to use any of those things? No. You never felt like this guy's doing it. Maybe I should look into this too. He's getting better numbers, playing better ball. I've never felt overmatched on the baseball field. I've always been in a very strong dominant position. And I felt that if I did my, my work since I've done, since I was uh, you know, a rookie back in Seattle, uh, I didn't have a problem competing at any level. So. Uh, Shoulder shrug, which is uncertainty, lips disappear, and then we have contempt on one side of the face. You may be wondering, Janine, why aren't you showing us business people? Because you're not videotaping your business meetings. So I have, I have criminals and athletes and politicians. We don't have a lot of business people because they're not being videotaped in these moments of when they're being contemptuous or deceptive. Do you think you've done anything wrong? 
on the advice of counsel, I invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and respectfully decline to answer your question. Screlly is a real peach, right? Did you see the contempt? Contempt, moral superiority. You can see it's on one side of your face. So everybody is different. Everybody can be different. Surprise, again, the quickest of all the emotions. First of all, for this one, you have to like pay really close attention to me, okay? okay. Look at me really, really intently. Like you're really listening to something like- ah! I want you to see surprise is always the catalyst <clears throat> to another emotion. What emotion does Will Smith go from surprise to what? Like ah! Scared. Does this look like scared right here? Oh, What's this? Happy. 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 Yeah, so he goes from surprise to happiness. Happy. Right? Right, surprise to happiness. We actually don't see fear. Goes right surprise into happiness, getting a kick out of it. Okay, watch it again. Thing to something like. Ah! See, surprise only lasts. Look at no more than two to three seconds max. Let's count it out. One, two. His surprise. One, two. So it's it's literally less than two seconds long. Fear. You see the three or four whites of the eyes, then fear. You may remember on this fear, when we see the whites of the eyes, it might be fear. It can also, please write this down on your mind map. When you see the whites of the eyes, three or four, like in this video, we see all four. It's either fear, revulsion, or distress. It's either fear, revulsion, or distress. You may remember I showed you a video of OJ Simpson when he was shown a picture wearing Bruno Magli shoes that in a previous interview, he said he would never own those shoes. As a matter of fact, he said, quote, I would never own those, quote, ugly ass shoes. And yet they show him a picture walking in the field in those shoes. When they, when they show him that picture, look what happens. OJ shows that. OJ's eyes come in with fear. Review looking at exhibit one, correct? Yes. And the jacket you're wearing, could you describe it? No. Do you remember owning that jacket? No. Do you remember wearing that jacket? Wearing that jacket. No. Remember wearing no. Remember jacket? No. Jacket? No. Jacket? No. Jacket? No. Jacket? No. Jacket. As a matter of fact, that's fear and sadness combo, which happens a lot. And we see this is earlier when he said he would never own those ugly shoes. And then here's what happens when he's shown a picture. When fear is here, white eyes appear. Lips disappearing, write this down. When lips disappear, someone could be anxious or stressed or worried. I like to say, uh, when we don't like what we, see, what we see or hear, our lips disappear. Look at this. Elliot Spitzer, I don't know if you remember him. He used government funds to get a pay for a lady of the evening in Washington, DC. Then we went into level three, deception, and we brought in Frank Marsh. And Frank talked about all kinds of fabulous information. If you missed it, um, every now and then he does a live event with me at night, uh, public events. Uh, I'd be more than happy to have you come in and um, just life changing. So much, talk about a lot of information. He's so much information. I think for me, the biggest thing is uh, if you just simply remember everything says something. So every everything says something. And, pay attention and Frank could talk to us about everyone's words are different. You know, what does someone's words mean? You know, everybody, my grandmother used to call the car the auto. When someone's words, their own vocabulary changes, that's a hot spot. I pulled these, these are um, some dating profiles. So I'm gonna give you guys a little test right here. So as I told you, I just recently went through a divorce. So now I'm on this dating website, okay? And this dating website is, I can't do it. I, I pulled myself from it. I'm going to have to meet someone the old fashioned way because I just, I can't do it. Um, how did I know all three of these guys were phonies? So I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes and then uh, I'm going to have you put in notes. Why did I know they were fake? And then I reported them and then the company wrote back, thank you, you were correct. How did I know all three of these guys were fake? 
So I'm going to give you a second and let's put your detecting deception skills Frank Marsh gave you to the test. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes, read all three, write down a couple notes. Why, why did I think they were scams? And we'll have a couple of you share. Everyone can write your notes in the chat section. Okay, let's see, let me check out the notes, what you guys wrote. Okay, write it up in chat. All right, Jen says, non-unique catchphrase, type profiles, words designed to elicit specific emotional responses, nothing really personal. Sonia says, all I notice is poor grammar, KP. Okay. Self-centered profile names. First one's grammar is awful. Second, third are the same starts. All open-minded, says he's trustworthy. Truthful people, write this down if you don't have it already. Truthful people convey, liars try to convince. Truthful people convey, liars try to convince. So let's look at this first one. He's overselling us. I am a nice person, an open-minded man with a pure heart. What American man would ever in a million years say pure heart? So Doug, would you write in a dating profile, you have a pure heart? Uh, I don't think I could say that without bursting into flame. Right, no. so <laughs> I have a pure heart and sincere intentions. Who says I have sincere? Louis, would you say you have sincere intentions on a dating profile? <laughs> I it's like, it's, it's overcompensating, right? Truthful people. I don't, don't want to. I don't want to disclose people's information, but this sounds a lot like Doug Cropsey's. He says, <laughs> 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 All right, I'm down to earth with a heart of gold. I believe in treating everyone the same way, and we want every the same way we want to be treated. Get to know me and know all about me. Scam, and he was a scammer. Okay. Now over here, loving guy, zero, one, one, okay? And these guys look cute, right? It's not really them, of course. Right? I think they're probably written by women. Uh, I'm very, I'm a very open-minded person, someone who accepts people as they are. I'm a fair individual. All right, David Bowles, would you say in a dating profile, if you were single, that you're a fair individual? That's weird. How would you say that it, David? David, how would, you, how would you phrase it? It's an American man. honest i'm and honest I yeah i'm a fair yeah. individual no this no. is someone that doesn't speak english who adapts yeah. to changes in life and enjoys life to the fullest i pride myself in being honest and most trustworthy would you would anyone say most trustworthy no no i like I mean, a strong it's... sense of being what does i like a strong sense of being mean kp what does that mean i like a strong sense of being <laughs> i don't even know what he's going for <laughs> Okay, of knowing- I like where, a strong there, sense of being. There you go, there you are, right. Of knowing where in life you want to be and whom you want to be with, okay? I'm a very open-minded person, someone who accepts people. So look, same exact thing, right? That I can love and cherish, look at this. So my life with good times and bad times, a woman that I can love and cherish with my whole being, John East, would you write this on a dating profile? You're looking for a woman that you can love and cherish with your whole being? 
I mean, if I didn't want to get matches, sure. <laughs> so I thought it would be fun just to pull this. I'm, I'm going to turn it into a course because it, there were so many scams on this on this one particular site. It was amazing. I loved it. You know, I talk about turning lemonade into uh, lemons into lemonade. Um, and there's certain things that people write. So I'm showing you this as an example of your brain wants to make sense of the mumbo jumbo people are saying to you. And I want you to slow it down and pay attention to what they're really saying to you. Okay. What they're really saying. Uh, Casey Anthony was asked about a uh, smell of a dead body in the trunk of her car. And she said, dead squirrels climbed into her trunk and died. What? So dead squirrels, what are they, zombie squirrels? So, but our brain says, oh, what she means is a squirrel died in the trunk. Be careful of giving people the benefit of the doubt and letting your brain make sense of their mumbo jumbo, okay? So that's why I'm saying, read these types of things out loud. Pay attention to the emails and text messages you get. <clears throat> words, I want you to write this down. Word, this is Frank Marsh. Words stand for our relationships to things. Words do not stand for things. So when you're listening to people's words, words stand for our relationship to things. Words don't stand for things. The number one miscommunication reason for stress. The number miscommunication is the number one reason for stress. Number one, miscommunication. Think about that. You can think about that in your personal and business lives. The number one reason for stress and violence is miscommunication. If Frank were here, he would tell you, make sure you define the terms and narrow the focus of your questions. Get very specific. Like TED Talks are supposed to be one point that you go deep on. And the inability to forgive yourself increases your stress. And it's the number one way you'll gain weight. So if there's something you need to forgive yourself for, it's the number one way you're going to gain weight. So maybe you need to start learning how to forgive yourself. We then went over, and I'm not going to go in extensive detail here, but I did do a mind map on the um, six basic human needs, and I'll send it to Chanda to send if we didn't send it already for a review. Um, I'll, I'll text that to you, Chanda, um, during our next little breakout room, so you have that to send to everybody. You re may remember them, though. I'm going to go over them briefly. So we have certainty and uncertainty, and uncertainty is also variety. And so these are 100% of our time and energy are divided among these two. So for me, I love a lot of uncertainties, about 70% and I'm 30. Some were similar to me, some were balanced and some were shifted the other way. You have associates on your team also that might be different than you here. Some people thrive. As a matter of fact, if some people are a little bored, they'll, caught, they'll stir the pot and create some internal drama at the company. So if you have drama makers at your company, you may wanna consider, are they getting bored? Do they want more work, more variety? Because uncertainty is also variety. Then we have the other two on a scale, which was what? Love and connection. Most people will settle for connection because love can be too scary. So they'll, they'll settle for connection. They'll get pets, right? So they'll have some, a, a pet instead of a relationship with a human. So love and connection versus significance. And my significance bucket's high. Ideally, we want to be at 50-50. So my significance is pretty high. So I like to be thanked a lot. I remember Chanda's was pretty high. A couple other people had pretty high. We want to feel like we're contributing to the world and we want to be acknowledged for us contributing to the world. Like we don't, you don't have to pay us back. Just a thank you would be nice. Just acknowledging that we're working hard. Other people would be the opposite. Don't care about any significance. You closed like this huge multi-million dollar home and you don't need anyone to know. You don't even care. You're super private. And, but you have a high need for our love and connection. So we can sometimes butt heads because our basic human needs are different. Then growth and contribution. So growth is learning new things and contribution is giving to others and expecting nothing in return. Those are not on a scale. Those are not on a scale. We also did NLP and I love that someone in the review, I'm forgetting who, maybe Sonia talked about body language and the eye movements with neuro-linguistic programming. Visual people, we look up to process pictures. We look to our ears when we're processing sound. We also look down left with internal dialogue, having a conversation and down right for emotions. And I always say, think down right angry, remember the emotions. We view eye movement based on the other person's perspective, not our perspective. So if I'm looking at Doug Cropsey here and I'm trying to decode what's his preferred modality, is he visual, auditory, kin kinesthetic? Uh, and look, look um, to your bottom right for me, Doug. 
I, this would be bottom right because I'm looking from Doug's perspective, not bottom left on the, of the screen. I would say he looked bottom right. Now, some lefties can be backwards. So if you ever see me on TV and I see someone look down, I don't know if they're an internal dialogue or if they're an emotion. So I will say there one of two things is happening here. They're either having a conversation with themselves or they're experiencing some, some major emotions in this moment for them to have that downward look. Visual people tend to use, use words like, I see what you're saying. Auditory people will use words like, how's this sound to you? Listen, listen, listen to this, listen. Kinesthetic people might say something like, get a hold of this. And you are given in your workbook a list of different words people use. Then we went into the little rascals. You may remember, this is the next level, right? So this is level four, where we talked about persuasion techniques, RAS, CLS, reciprocity. I do for you, you do for me, you owe me. All right, but reciprocity, remember it has to be a unique gift. That was something that I, an unexpected, something that would be unique, something I would care about. Um, authority, the, the World Trade Center, the voice of God, everything's okay. The other tower was hit by an airplane. You can go back to your desks in this tower. That's the voice of God. Um, security officers, nurses, doctors, uh, police officers, uh, a person in a uniform will have a position of authority. I showed you a video of people in a mall pretending to be someone important with a camera and a microphone. Everyone was, they were talking, saying mumbo jumbo about the world and people believed them because the guy had a camera and a microphone. <clears throat> Social proof, you see other people doing it, so you end up doing it. Commitment and consistency. This is also called foot in the door approach. This is where you get someone to do something really small. You may remember I showed you the video of Sheldon from How I Met Your Mother. He was really sick. He had the neighbor come in and she's like, no, I got to go, Sheldon. He's like, please just get me to my room. Please, please just a glass of water. And then she gets in there and he's like, oh, can you put Vicks Raper Rub on my chest? Please rub it in. I hate the smell of it, but I, I can't touch it. So then she's rubbing it in. And then he goes, can you sing this song that my mother used to sing to me? Bye, bye, babe, whatever it was. Little bunny, happy bunny. And so she sang the song. If he had said to her out in the hall, will you come in, rub Vicks Vapor Rub on my chest and sing me a song my mother sang about a bunny when I was a kid, she would have said no. So this commitment and consistency means getting people to do small little favors for you first. Then you go bigger and bigger. Liking, when we like people who like ourselves, then that makes sense. We already know this, it's rapport building. And then we also know scarcity, right? There's only two left uh, or this price will be gone by tomorrow. This is different than the Benjamin Franklin effect. What is the Benjamin Franklin effect? Who can tell me? Who remembers what it is? Will you do me a favor? Yeah, and then tell me more about it. So will you do me a small favor? And I want to, you always want it to be a small favor. And then what happens? You trick them into liking you. You trick them into liking you. How do you trick them into liking you? What happens in their brain? You don't do favors for people that you dislike. That's right, Doug. You don't do favors for people you don't like. So this is where you've heard of this word probably before called cognitive dissonance. So if I'm not really crazy about Doug here, um, but I ask, uh, Doug yeah. asked me to do me a, him a favor. And he says, Janine, will you do me a quick favor? I have a relative coming up to Old Town. I know you live in Old Town, Alexandria area. Will you just tell me if uh, which hotel is has good COVID rest, you know, restrictions right now that's wearing masks? If you could ask around or... And I go, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do that for you. My favorite is to go to whatever, the embassy suites. Let me give them a call for you or I'll get you the information. But I wasn't really crazy about Doug before, right? And now all of a sudden I do this small favor. The action always outweighs the mental thought. Cognitive dissonance happens. We have two competing thoughts. The behavior, the action will always overweigh the mental thought. So that's the Benjamin Franklin effect and hit Google on it if you, if you wanna find out more on how the Benjamin Franklin effect works. You may also remember we talked about open loops. What's an open loop? Anyone remember? Anyone remember? Maybe I talked about open loops in the second group, not this one. No. All right, so we'll have to talk about open loops another time. We didn't get to talk about open loops. So we'll talk about open loops another, another time. So let's see, let's go in, back in. Um, now we go the final stretch, our last two programs, and then we'll answer any questions and we'll do the case study on um, Legos and then we'll do Art of Tudor Gratitude. Uh, 
decode the four interaction styles. As a matter of fact, let's take a 10 minute break here. What, what time are we at? We're at 3.30. So let's take a five minute break. Take a five minute stretch break. We're gonna go into the four interaction styles, sharing, private, versatile and neutral. And then we'll do a sneak peek again into the program we just did last month on uh, how people make decisions in those three areas, research, reasoning, and the result. We have investigating and exploring. Investigating is research with depth, exploring is research with creativity, breath. Then we have in that middle stage re uh, reasoning, we have determining, standing your ground, persisting against difficult odds. And we have evaluating, creating a system, weighing pros and cons. Um, then in that last stage, the result, we have timing, which is acting fast, accelerating or decelerating like a snake, slowing down or speeding up. And then we have that anticipating wolf we talked about briefly when someone mentioned earlier the concert, like, let's not talk about it while it's being videotaped. That's anticipating. It's thinking about the consequences. It's running scenarios. It's leaning into the past, avoiding mistakes from the past, but taking in big wins from the past to the now and leaning into the future and taking the future to now. All right, so let's take a five minute break. It's three, we'll say 335. We'll see you at 340 for our final stretch.
All right, welcome back. Here we go. Decode the four interaction styles. Again, this is part of movement pattern analysis. This was level five. A movement pattern analysis, I say it's game time. It's, it's, we're all putting the puzzle together, um, but we just do it differently. And we can all play the same game, but we're gonna get different results. Movement pattern analysis is elite discipline system in which very specific behaviors and movements are objectively analyzed and evaluated. We move in a pattern that can be analyzed. These movements directly correlate with your cognitive processes, your thinking, and your core motivation and decision-making. And so this has been scientifically proven by something called grounded theory. Harvard's done studies on this, Brown, um, the Naval War College. It's, it started in Europe in the UK when, during World War II when the birth of consultants came about. So right here, just like we all have a regular fingerprint, we also have a behavioral fingerprint that connects to how we make decisions in life and how we're motivated. This is little baby Matthias. Little baby Matthias, this is the stage of development where Matthias rolls over. He's going to use his forehead to his fanny to move over. All right, Matthias, let's see it. Can you wiggle? Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. So little Matthias wiggles over. Watch this. This is the stage of development where Matthias, you might catch him looking at his hands or his toes. This is self. So in one of my TED Talks, uh, I think it's called the Cooperation Paradigm. I say, if you can't giggle it off, wiggle it off. So write that down. If you can't giggle it off, wiggle it off. When we move our bodies from our forehead to our fanny, it brings us back to self. It brings us back to self. Where does this come from? Authentic movement that all human beings make as babies, even before Matthias crawled, that rolling over part is part of our development. Your body is sending messages to your brain. It's not just your brain sending messages to your body. So when you notice you're mad at the world or mad at everybody else and you're stressed, uh, wiggle, put on some music, dance, just have to make sure you could sit in your chair and just do this for 15 seconds and it'll change the game for you. It brings it back to self and control. And you start thinking again with your neocortex. This is my baby Jack, who's now seven, like baby Yui. He's a giant. He's uh, six and a half inches older than, uh, taller than his bigger brother, older brother. Uh, but this is Jack when he was a baby, the stage of crawling. Crawling connects to that determining, right? That increase in pressure. This is the stage where Jack is going and exploring the world, right? Exploring, you may remember, is spreading and enclosing. The movements themselves are not important for you to know other than there's movements that connect to this stuff. So you think of Jack, what's he doing as he's crawling? He's spreading his body, he's an increase in pressure. This is all being developed, his determining and his exploring here. Hi! Jack! Jack's like a crab. All right, so this wiggle is self-exploration, increase in pressure, and then that, that um, uh, um, spreading and enclosing, it's connected with other exploration. And then we went over the, some of the movements. I'm not gonna do that today. Uh, when we get into these four interaction styles, we know about sharing, it's typically called an extrovert. And then we know about privacy, which is a typical introvert. So sharing this person initiates collaboration any stage of the decision-making process, research, reasoning, and result. Private, this person prefers to work privately. They wanna make decisions independently, per, preferring to be uh, free of the influence of others. Versatile means you're both. Now the catch on versatile, and if you didn't mind map your workbook, I recommend you do, is the switch can go subconsciously. So um, I could tell Chanda, hey Chanda, I love the couch in your room. And I might see her a couple of days later and she might say, Janine, I can't believe you didn't tell me that you like the couch in my room. I got a new couch, you're usually so good at complimenting. And I could say um, either I'm versatile and I thought in my head I told her, but I didn't. Or I really did tell Chanda, but she's versatile and she was in a private moment and she wasn't listening when I told her. So we're not really sure, but it's likely one of us, if we believe that I told you, one of us is versatile. It's either Chanda, myself, it could be even both of us. And then neutrals, the neutrals, this is the person that comes across as a little awkward because they don't have a strong preference for either sharing or private. So do you remember what's the neutrals way of getting out of something? When you ask the neutral, hey, you wanna go to lunch? Hey, hey, you want to go to lunch? What does the neutral say when they're trying to get out of it? Do you remember? 
you really want me to go to lunch? Want me to go? Yeah. yeah well, do you want yes. me to go? And then what do we normally say? Yes. Yeah. I yeah. Asked you. That's why I'm asking you, right? And we think in our head, boy, they need some more self-confidence. What we didn't realize is this is the neutrals way of getting out of going to lunch with you, but they don't have a strong enough need to, to go into that privacy, even though they were thinking, I'm just going to go to the room and sleep. I have a headache for an hour. Where the private introverted person will just say, oh, I'm good. I'm going to go to the room and, and relax for a minute. They'll have no problem advocating for themselves. Same thing with the versatility. If they're in a private mode, like, oh, you go, I'm going to, I'm going to just get something to eat with room service. Thanks. I'm good but the neutral, you're going to pull them back in. So now we know, listen, it's not a big deal. We're going to lunch either way. You can chill on your own. Only half of us are going uh, and not pull them out of that privacy and not pull them out of that privacy. You may remember I used Phoebe from friends because neutrals think you know what they know. They think they are that you already know it. And Phoebe from friends works for Chandler's new company or the company he works for. And he goes, it pays to know the big boss. And she says, I didn't tell anyone I knew you. And he's like, why? Why not? She goes, oh, because no one likes you. He goes, nah. He goes, she goes, yeah, I thought you knew that. Neutrals assume they really do. They think we know what they know. Hey, how was the first day? Oh, excellent. Everyone was so, so nice. See, it pays to know the man who wears my shoes. Me. <laughs> no, I didn't tell anybody that I knew you. Why not? Oh, because, you know, they don't like you. <laughs> what? I thought you'd do that. No. Uh -uh. <laughs> Who doesn't like me? Everyone. <laughs> Except for, um, no, everyone. <laughs> what are you talking about? Don't feel bad. You know, they used to like you a lot. But then you got promoted, and, you know, now you're all like Mr. Boss Man. You know, Mr. Big. Mr. Big. Boss Man Big. <laughs> I can't believe it. Okay, so neutral. I showed you a company out of the Seattle area and showed how their interaction styles can be different in each stage. The first line on each of these represents the research area. The second line represents that middle stage of decision making. We call it the bridge between research and execution. It's called re uh, reasoning. And the last line on each of these is the result. It's that last stage, it's the, the actual doing. So you can look at Amy, right? So Amy can be sharing or private gathering research, sharing or private talking about pros and cons, but when it comes to doing things, she's not gonna go to, it's unlikely she'll go to lunch with you or the hockey game. So we can see Brandy here wants to gather a whole bunch of research and do it with you side by side together. She wants to small talk. She probably talks a lot, which she does and gets in some trouble about it, but then she can have some privacy elsewhere. Then we went into the other part of, of movement power analysis. It's how this was last month, how people make decisions. These three areas of decision-making, I attending, it's attending to the issue, the possibility, the opportunity. I call it research because it's just research with depth and breath. Intending is what your intention is. I call this right here, reasoning. What's your reason for doing something, your intention? and committing that final result, execution, I call that the result because it's literally the result. We're not gonna get concerned with the percentages here because this goes deep in and of itself. So this was a 13 month program I took at Columbia College in Chicago. Um, I don't even know, maybe six years ago now. We've profiled over 200 people. We only pick four companies, about four a year because it's very time uh, intensive. We interview each person for a two hour interview, it takes 10 hours to code each person. They then get two hour feedback session. It's like your owner's manual, operation manual from a car for your life. And then we do a two day workshop with the executive team reintroducing everybody. And they have to solve some challenges and projects. And we put we create teams based on profiles and, and then coach. And so there's um, nine people on my profiling team. And usually when we do these events, uh, it, we bring about four of us out. It's very time intensive, but it's, a, it's intensive, but it's a, it's a game changer for people. So if that's something you want in, in part of your team, be sure to reach out to me and I'll let you know. Uh, we're booked right now though for 2021. All right, so right here, these three stages, this yellow stage, these, these, these two are research with depth is investigating. Exploring, thinking laterally, right out here is um, with breath. Then we have in this middle stage, reasoning, we have determining and evaluating, and then we had timing and anticipating. So investigating with depth, exploring with breath, 
determining standing your ground, persisting against difficult odds, evaluating, confront a problem or situation by establishing main points and prioritizing, judging. Timing is timing is everything. Find the right moment to act and seize opportunities can speed up or slow down. Anticipating, this is right here, looking at the long-term needs and opportunities. These people run scenarios right here, play out scenarios all the time. And they pay attention to alertness of trends. These are my eagles. The investigating eagle can spot a, a prey, a fish from two miles to three miles in the sky. And so these are my investigators. They go deep. They, they research the research and then often recommend more research if they're high in this area. If you're moderate, it means you'll go there when you need to. And if you're, which I'm moderate here, if you go, if you're low, it means you go there quickly or an afterthought. You have typos and you don't do a lot of research. You trust, trust other people's data. The owl, we always think of the owl with his head turning all the way around. The exploring owl is seeing things other people don't see. It's not just the head turning around. Both eyes can go in different directions and take a panoramic picture and see what other people can't see. If a human were to turn their head like an owl, they would suffer traumatic ar ar arterial injuries and fatal blow blood flow uh, interruptions. Oh, that's just a video about owls. We're not going to watch that. Um, right here, the determining donkey, persisting against difficult odds. When the going gets tough, they get tougher. The donkey will go with you as long as he wants to go with you. When he's done, he's done. So that's that determining. Come on, Jules. He needs a bath. I think you got to push him. Come on. Doodle. Come on. Come on. Oh, good boy. Go. No, you're standing on your rope. Doodle. Come on. You're not going to melt. Push. Come on, Doodle. Get over here. Doodle. It's spring bath time. Maybe you're a doodles like me and you can get a little stubborn. Then we have the evaluating dolphin. Dolphins can break off a piece of coral and use it as a back scratcher. Very, um, this is all about evaluating, creating that system, coming up with a tool. Diana places a one-way mirror inside the observation window to test the dolphins. So now we're looking through a window and they'll be seeing a mirror. Dolphins don't behave like this, staying in one place and staring. If they simply meet another dolphin, this suggests they understand that what they're seeing isn't another animal, but a reflection of themselves. One action never normally seen is this curious fin wiggling. It's an example of what scientists call self-directed behavior. Things the dolphins only do when they're looking in the mirror. Other self-directed behaviors, including looking inside their mouths and twisting to see their belly. They are using the mirror like a tool to look at parts of their own bodies they usually can't see. This looks nothing like what they do when they're socially interacting with so they're, the dolphins here are evaluating themselves, that evaluating. The timing snake can go fast or slowly coil around you. So being in, that, being in that moment, being in that moment. And last but not least, the anticipating wolf, the anticipating wolf. So very strategic. They don't attack until they have opportune time to have the least amount of, least amount of injuries. And when they fight for, to be an alpha, they don't scratch or bite. They just pretend to do those things. You can see this picture of wolves. It's very fascinating. We're here in Yellowstone National Park. To follow some I'm not going to play this whole video, but if you've not seen this picture before, you can see it online. And what happens is 
the, uh, let me go back to the front, is the elderly wolves lead the pack. So you can see them in the snow a little bit, then come the stronger wolves, and then the babies, and then some more strong wolves. So as we put it together, that's movement pattern analysis. 100% of your time and energy are spent in these six categories. And everybody's different. Your puzzle is different than someone else. There's seven to 8 billion people on planet Earth, seven to 8 billion. And there are 36 billion different profiles on how these movements come together and create your own profile. So we talked about last month, which one do you spend the most time in and which one might someone who drives you crazy might they spend the most time in. If you go over that questionnaire that Chanda has, you'll be able to put it all together. And then this is putting some a company, this is a different company, um, uh, largest lighting and plumbing supply company in North America called Ferguson. And they brought us in for their um, executive team for their credit union. And this is what their profiles look like. This is a team profile just to show all these different numbers. Based on this information, I could tell you all the strengths and weaknesses of everyone in this company, even if I don't remember them. We are out of time because we're at the 357 mark. So we won't have time to do the Legos um, case study. However, I highly recommend you check out the Legos case study. Um, I can um, shoot that over to Chanda as well for you guys to watch on your own to figure out, can you figure out what part of the profile they used to be so successful? Um, it's unbelievable story. If you don't know the story of Legos and how it was all created. So I'll shoot that video to um, Chanda and you have no homework because this is our last class. I want to open it up for any questions you guys have and then um, we'll do a quick attitude of gratitude. I know some of you may have to leave in the next two minutes. Thank you for being here for the last um, nine months, eight or nine months together. It's been wonderful getting to meet you and to consider me part of your family. I put you my cell phone number in that email earlier. Um, you can always reach out to Chanda to get my information. And if I can help you, your team, personally or professionally, um, please reach out. Texting is the best way to reach me. I loved meeting all of you and having you share. You're such an amazing group and, and you work for a great, great company. And big thanks to Laura for investing in this program and big thank you to Chanda for doing all the behind the scenes. A lot of work happened without you guys knowing it behind the scenes. Lots of emails and calls with Chanda. And uh, Any questions before we end the whole program with something you're grateful for and your big takeaway um, from today's program, something you needed to hear again? Anybody? No questions? All right, let's go in. Who wants to go first? Jacqueline, start with your attitude of gratitude for me. Um, I am grateful for everyone on the call, as well as the opportunity to work with um, you. And of course, the vaccine opening up to more people. Mm -hmm. um, and my big takeaway is it's always a good reminder for me to listen and be interested and not interesting. I love it. Pick who goes next, Jacqueline. Thank you. Uh, oh, everybody's jumping off They're jumping on grab off. before they leave, right? Um, I know Renee has a one o'clock, so I'll make her go next. Renee! Hi there. Um, so my takeaway, two big takeaways and good reminders for me, I talked about it in one of my breakouts. Also, what Jacqueline just mentioned is be interested, not interesting. But also the reset um, was a really good reminder for me. Um, and my gratitude is to my family, both my work and professional families. Awesome. Thank you. Pick who goes next. Uh, Mary. Oh, I, I, um, I don't want to repeat what everybody's saying, but I just, I just learned that I'm applying things without even knowing it. Mm. I didn't, I didn't think. Um, I was getting, I, I'm never going to be you. I'm not going to know all the stuff, you know, everything that you jammed into my head, a lot of it went out, but there's some things I know that stuck. So I'm going to challenge you guys that I'm my teams to, to call me on some stuff that you see since you're, you, sh you got the joy here. So thanks Mary. Okay. And something you're grateful for in life, Mary. Um, just life. Good. Pick who goes next. Thanks, Mary. Uh, David. David Bowles. Hey, buddy. We don't hear you yet. I know. I can't click the thing. Um, I was typing. So, all right. So the thing today that I was, I was typing, um, 
a lot of good reminders. And one of the ones that I, what I was writing down or typing it was uh, meeting people where they're at. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's a good takeaway. Um, and then my gratitude, and I've got to drop some now late for four o'clock, but my gratitude was uh, something that I'm aware of uh, is like being able to p- meet my kids at the school bus now. So I, I mm. you know, since I'm working remote and the kids come home and so I, I get the dog and we walk down and, and I greet the kids at the school bus with the dog. So it's kind of fun. So I'm, that's cool. Enjoy, that. Enjoy your meeting. Yep. It's been a pleasure oh. meeting you. All right, you David, too. All right. next before you leave me? Pick someone else. Oh, um, let's see. How about Chanda? Chanda. Hmm. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye, David. You guys. Um, my biggest takeaway was a reminder, and I think I would say ditto to what Mary said, is that I've been doing a lot of these things without realizing until you started talking about them today. And I'm like, oh, that's right. I've been doing that. I've been doing that. I've been doing that. Um, but I think the biggest takeaway I've had for the last nine months is name it to tame it. Mm. There's a lot of times I would get frustrated and angry and not realize why and being able to figure out what that real emotion is and what I feel like was causing the problem has been huge for me, both at work and at home. Um, And then my biggest attitude, I mean, Janine, it's been great having you come into our lives and teaching us everything. So I'm grateful for that connection we've made and, you know, family. I think over the last year, I've not, we haven't traveled. And so I've actually gotten to be a mom every single evening and it's been phenomenal. That's awesome. That's great, Chanda. It's been a pleasure. May I pick someone out next in our last couple of people? Uh, Ms. Kels. Kelsey. Hello. Um, just, uh, I think my biggest takeaway from the entire thing is just more about moving your body to move your mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, giggle it out or wiggle it out, you know, just being able to move and, and not being such a static at, at my desk person and, and just imparting that knowledge onto other people because they get frustrated and they get upset and they, you know, especially in, in my world where we're training so much. So um, I like to give that to them and, and, and just, it, I think it's very helpful. Um, uh, my gratitude today is again, just being able to be a part of this group. Um, I've gotten to meet so many people that I hadn't gotten to before. So um, I really, really have enjoyed that. So thank you so much. Great. Yeah. Those breakout rooms are so fun for you guys to build rapport with one another. That's awesome. Kelsey, pick, pick someone else. Sandy, have you gone yet? Nope. Sandy. <laughs> Um, I think one of my biggest takeaways is like Renee said, um, and to add to what Kelsey was saying as well is the, um, the power of the reset, you know, um, like, like Kelsey said, we're, you know, so static and, you know, constantly go, 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 but just remembering to reset, to recharge, you know, not only for ourselves but, you know, for the others that we're going to be, you know, associating with. So, um, I think it's pretty powerful. And then just so many, so many other things. And then everything that I'm grateful for, lots of things as well, but um, to you for your time, um, for our leadership team, for um, allowing me to uh, join you all, because I I have learned a lot and I've grown, grown a lot too. So very appreciative. Thanks, Sandy. Pick who goes next. Um, Who hasn't gone? I think think David's the only one left. And Mary, right? Mary Conley? Mary went. Mary went. I went. Mary went. Okay. Yeah. David, Uh, are you here? He might have had to drop off for a phone call, so he's probably on that other phone call. (laughs) All right. Well, my attitude of gratitude is spring is here. It's beautiful weather, and uh, my pool behind me just opened up. Uh, The guy's been working on it for a week, and today it looks clean finally. Uh, (laughs) And uh, it's really exciting to uh, have this nice warm weather and a new beginning. So I wish you all good luck. If I can uh, support you and help you or your loan officers in any way, please let me know. And uh, hopefully we cross paths again in person without masks and without a camera in front of us. Yeah, Mary. Uh, I, I lost the instruction on the mani- manifestation prayer and how I could get a hold of that. Oh, good. So text me and I'll send it to you right now. I'll give you the number. It's excellent. And uh, it's a game changer for me. So my cell phone number is 202-271-0922. And if you send it to me, I'll send you two versions. One, I'm a Christian, so I don't know if you're a Christian. So I have a Christian version, uh, and then I have a non-Christian version. So right. um, Christian version's longer because I use um, promises from God in there. But I'll send them to you. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thanks again.
Bye, everybody. Happy Bye. 2021. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. See you. Bye, kiddo. Thanks for everything. Okay.